Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Ellen, I didn't catch that. Yep. I'm recording. Okay. We record everything here, so. So what is your boundary, roughly? Or well, th the uh, new boundary. Yes, thank you, um, Mayor and Council. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I, I have a map of the new constituency that I'm happy to distribute, uh, if you would like, as well. Uh, it okay. takes in uh, a wide swath of Wheatland County. In fact, um, I believe approximately two-thirds of the county will be inside uh, the new constituency of Old Stidsbury Three Hills. So I'm happy to just send those around for you. If sure, you like. please. Uh, so thank you for um, the invite, or I, I'm not sure, maybe I uh, invited myself and then you accepted my imposition, uh, but either way, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, as you all know, I'm the member for Old Stidsbury Three Hills and following uh, the boundary redistribution after the 2019 election, the constituency changed substantially. Uh, you now all have a map in front of you uh, that you can see uh, a large portion of Wheatland County will now be considered to be Old Stidsbury Three Hills. Um, you know, that presents some uh, unique opportunities as well as challenges. Uh, I, I hope to view them as opportunities uh, as we begin to um, build some relationship together. I guess the purpose of my visit today is, is mostly just to say hello, uh, take some questions from you. Uh, should I be fortunate enough uh, to be entrusted as the member for Old Stidsbury Three Hills after the 2019 election. Uh, you can reach out to some of the other communities that are currently in Old Stidsbury Three Hills, but I endeavor uh, to try to do council visits twice a year. I have a sort of hard commitment to myself that it will be once a year, but essentially leading into the spring session and the fall session, I tried to make an official visit uh, to councils all around the, the constituency. It may be a little bit more difficult following the next election because uh, it's going from 13 municipalities to 15 or 16, perhaps 17 municipalities. Obviously, there's a, a new school division in there, and uh, so it, it will get a little bit busier, but my commitment to at least being here in an official capacity once a year uh, will remain uh, and, and I will endeavor to do it twice a year, both leading into the session. So um, my goal, I guess, I, uh, is to do everything that we can to work together where there's mutual benefit or concern. Uh, even going forward now, my uh, office is your office in terms of if there's areas uh, that I could be of assistance to the county. Uh, please feel free to reach out to the office of Old Sids of Hills. I understand that you uh, currently have a sitting MLA. I'm not entirely sure of the relationship that you may or may not have with that individual, but um, I'm happy to uh, be of assistance where possible. Uh, I'm looking to build some relationships in, in this corner of the constituency, as you see on the map there. Rosebud, Hazar, Standard, Makepeace. Um, are all now part of uh, the constituency. Uh, I will be hosting a, um, a breakfast meeting, sort of a meet and greet community function. Uh, I believe it's going to be in Rockyford on October the 23rd. Uh, it'll be a breakfast. I'm just uh, going to have some discussions with the primary restaurateur there in Rockyford. Uh, on my drive home today to see if we might be able to uh, figure out a plan where we could um, invite 30 folks or so just to sort of begin to, to meet some, some people in the region. So uh, I say all that to say uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, feel free to uh, fire any question at my, uh, in, in my direction. I guess the only thing I would add is uh, I have a, a bit of a philosophy with respect to how to get things done in Edmonton. I think generally there's two ways to accomplish goals in Edmonton, uh, one with sugar and one with vinegar. Uh, I traditionally will err on the side of sugar to begin, uh, try to build relationships in Edmonton and accomplish a task uh, as opposed to just pour gas on a fire or vinegar uh, on someone. I, uh, I think both can be effective tools, but I think that the, the first is always a good start uh, and then and then utilize other um, 
avenues if if not successful in the first so that's the whole the type of relationship i uh, also hope to build with yourself mayor and council as well as the administration here uh, is really one a, a collaborative approach that uh, uh, we can tackle the important tasks that are before us uh, it won't come as a surprise to you that you know i i don't believe that the current government is taking us in the right direction but i also believe that the people in the current government are are good people they're just don't have very good ideas. So um, we need to uh, do what we can to uh, get the province back on track. And I think municipalities have a key part to play in that. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I couldn't possibly comment. Sure. Dennis has a question for you in the back. I'll let him ask. Uh, are you referring to the compost facility yeah. south of Acme, north of the county? Yeah. I am quite familiar. Oh, so the short answer is no. I am not familiar with GFL uh, with respect to their operations in the county of Wheatland. I am familiar uh, with their facility um, just outside of Acme, which is in the county of Nihil. Um, they have, uh, landowners there have had some ongoing concerns, some of which have been mitigated over the spring and summer period. Uh, my office consistently received communication uh, from those landowners um, through uh, last winter and the spring. Um, however, this this spring and summer, uh, that communication has significantly decreased. So um, my understanding is that at that facility anyway, they mitigated some of the concerns uh, that the landowners had. But with respect to the facility here in Wheatland County, I, I am not currently familiar with it, but I'm more than happy to receive a briefing either from uh, landowners like yourself or from, from the county if there's some shared, shared concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't. I didn't mean to refer to just uh, as one landowner, but like the landowners that are affected by that facility, I'm I'm more than happy to hear from. Trade yeah, absolutely. Yep. And I'll show you what isn't done over at Sure. And um, uh, today is going to prove difficult to go for a drive, but I'm more than happy to more than happy to connect with you. Yep. Absolutely. You bet. Well, and I'm. I'm going to be uh, back in the area uh, towards the end of October, but I'm more than happy to try to make uh, make some okay. time uh, make some time prior to then as well. Okay. Sure. And yeah. just for clarification, the one in Wheatland County, just so you know, Dennis is not actually in Nathan's boundaries. No. No. Oh, I can give you the map. It's over here. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's close. It's close Very to the boundary? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a couple miles off the Highway 21. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Highway 21 is the boundary there. So. Yeah. Now, having said all that, that's, uh, I'm still more than happy to uh, become familiar with the situation and work with um, presumably what will be my colleague from uh, uh, Brooks, Medicine Hat Brooks is my, my guess. Stra oh, so it's on this side? Chester okay, one. so the, um, sorry, I was thinking the opposite side. Yeah, um, yeah and I'll be happy to work with, uh, with my colleague from, from Strathmore, yeah. Chestermere, should, uh, or whoever becomes the member there. Right. Okay. You familiar with the CMRB? We're part of, but it wouldn't be in your new riding either. Calgary Metropolitan Regional yeah. Board. Yeah, so, I mean, I... There's no constituents. Uh, Crossfield is in. Rocky View County is in. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had some significant discussions uh, with the Reeve and members of Rocky View County with respect to the board and some of the frustrations um, that they have had over a long period of time uh, with the city. Um, uh, 
uh, but they would be the only two communities uh -huh. inside the constituency that are also uh, part of the board. Um, you know, some of the governance structure that the board has. Um, but I would be very interested to hear your perspective uh, on the board, given the distance from the city and and all of the the interesting factors. Because my assumption is you have a small portion of your boundary that puts you into the board. Is that correct? Yeah, just I couldn't say 900 and some people, and it's a corridor number one to Strathmore, around Strathmore, then back out again. Is what gets you in the board? Yeah, that's what's got us in. So it's uh, yeah, it makes it out to Eagle Lake, right? <clears throat> so it might be, it might be in that new one that goes down to the United States border piece of it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because just just over here, uh, the Cardston Six Sicker riding, yeah, that's shaped like an hourglass that runs literally from from Highway One all the way to the U.S. border. And there's a section there in the middle that I think is about 10 miles wide. Yeah. Um, I don't actually know what the number is, but it's not. It's there's a real pinch point there in in the constituency. So, so that's very possible. I, I guess what I would say is, the issues that face the county broadly um, will be quite uh, important to me, even if they're not necessarily in the constituency of Old Stidsbury, Three Hills, mm -hmm. like. Um, you know, like this little piece might not be in the constituency, but I'd like to uh, have your general sense on uh, if the the CRB or whatever the new name is. C C M R B. Yeah. Yeah. The the CRB is working well or not, and and some of the unique challenges that the more rural uh, counties and communities or smaller communities that are part of the CRB uh, face, and uh, frankly. Uh, should Albertans entrust us with uh, with the government purse and the government uh, after the 2019 election, um, what are some changes that may or may not need to be made to uh, those growth management boards um, post-2019? It's possible that there is no change that's necessary, but if um, there are uh, some significant changes that may be advantageous for both the board's sake as well as municipality's sake, um, these are the types of things that would be very important for us to know uh, in into and, and shortly after the next election if uh, Albertans select the United Conservative Party to govern. Information for you, I guess, more than a question. Now that if that territory comes in, you're in there, I'm assuming you're going to get in, get reelected in there anyway. But anyways, highways, 842 from Clooney up to the 564. Sorry, I'm, I'm grabbing my phone not because it's ringing, but because I have a map here on the phone that I will, uh, that I'm going to take a look at. Go ahead. Sorry. Continue. Okay. It's from, from Clooney North is a secondary higher provincial highway. Okay. And uh, up on the northeast corner, Dallum, east and west, there's a 569 that goes east and west of Dallum. We've been in discussion with the province for some years now on the uh, us taking over those roads so that we can maintain a road system. We did at one time have control over those secondaries and we had them in our road program for upgrading and rebuilding and paving and then the province took them over and it's come to a standstill and we've still got a uh, uh, on their books and on ours, we still have an offer with them to, to do something to those roads to get them up to grade, up to grade, up to non-band status, so that we can uh, take them over. And it just keeps getting shelved. So there's some. Uh, so you're offering the province, you're offering to maintain the road, and they're saying no. No. Well, we're, we're, no, no, it's no. a little more. We're we're asking them if they would pave the roads, okay, and then give it to us. Okay. And forever understood. after, we would uh, maintain them, repave them, but they're so they make the initial investment, and then you guys will take it from there. Yeah. yeah. And we even at one time we had even, and I don't know where the the, the nitty gritty of it right now, where it stands right now. But at one time we had even offered to help with the, the rebuilding the of the road, and then they put it to a non-paved standard, and then we would take the road over. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, <coughs> that's just north of Clooney, is it? From Clooney North up to the 564. Okay. 
Yeah. Got it here. North of Chancellor up there. And then the 569 goes east and west of Dow. And we have done work on And when was the last time you had an update from the Transportation Minister on that? A year ago. Every year we sit down with them and... Uh, they said they weren't willing to transfer assets to the county as yeah. they're trying to gather yeah. assets. But they won't do anything with the roads either. Yeah. At one time we had a program in place where we were, we were looking at trading and then things changed and we uh, stayed with what we had and we rebuilt the roads that we had and we've got them paid. Those are the only two out in that area that are still major transportation, at least. I don't know if you're aware, but down at Gleeson there's a major drain uh, terminal down there and those are our links to that terminal that uh, did the current member correspond correspond on your behalf for uh, for this project oh. okay I would be happy to connect with the minister uh, and and add my voice to what seems to be a fairly reasonable project um, they, uh, either now or in the future yeah, yeah. they uh, I think the ministry thinks it's a great idea. It's the finance department thinks it's a crappy idea because it would look like they're losing lots of money because of the they've uh, as fair the capital cost allowance type thing, and they'd have to show that as a loss in their books, and then that would look bad. Yeah. So it, it's an accounting. Thing getting in the way of common sense. I so guess. it's a political decision then getting yeah. in the way of common sense. Imagine yeah. that. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that's really bugging the municipality, especially in your area, would be ambulance mm. and the dispatch of, uh, of uh, first responders, dispatch of ambulance. We in the county still own and operate our ambulance but we lost dispatch. Right. And we would take it back in a heartbeat if it was offered to us, but mm -hmm. when the city took it, we had growing pains and it was getting better, then AHS took it over and we started right back. It was a runaway, yeah. And it's hard to talk to them without being treated in a condescending manner. With AHS? Yes. Mm -hmm. I uh, think some, a lot of work has to be done there. Yeah, for what it's worth, uh, I did have the opportunity to chat with Darcy Burke, and he also highlighted this as a as a significant concern for the region. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I again uh, would be more than happy to to communicate on this particular issue. You know, you're unique in the fact that you're able that you have been able to. Uh, continue to operate that asset um, but you're not unique in your concerns for the uh -huh. uh, ordinary at best dispatching that's coming out of AHS so um, I, I know that some of my colleagues have worked on this particular issue at some length uh, particularly Pat Steer who's the MLA for Livingston McLeod has worked very diligently and had some successes uh, over in that part of the, the province so uh, I'd be happy to follow up with you on this particular issue around uh, around ambulance and get a, a, a bit more broad uh, understanding from administration if you would prefer uh, uh -huh. and then be able to do some advocating on behalf of, of the county with respect to ambulance uh, dispatch and the operations of that, that particular um, uh, asset that you have as well as uh, expressing some concerns around uh, the way the relationship has been managed from AHS's perspective as well. And in particular, first responders. They're, right. They're, uh, in a lot of cases, they're getting to the call same time or in instances even after the ambulance has left. The, the dispatch of them is non-existent in a lot of times, right? So, sorry, help me understand. Who's so, getting to the call first? Ambulance. Well, you... The process in the county is you phone 911. Mm -hmm. Strathmore, we, we still help operate our call 911 center. And they ask if you need fire, police, or ambulance, and they'll right. say ambulance. So they push a button and it goes to AHS. AHS takes over the call and, and uh, they dispatch an ambulance. 
and then they're supposed to at the same time dispatch fire or otherwise yeah yeah fire or first our first responders team and a lot of times that doesn't happen until okay. the ambulance has got to the and you get out to that Dallam area or depending mm -hmm. where the closest ambulance is it's it's a considerable distance yeah. quite a okay time length so yeah understood okay we'll keep you informed we'll start to uh, CC in you on some. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Glenn. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Anything else? Okay. Yeah, we're as a region. We have a Wheatland Housing mm -hmm. Management Body. We have a lodge in Strathmore, hundred beds roughly. We own Sunset Manor and Giffen in Strathmore. They are senior self-contained units. We own some in Rocky Ford, Gleeson, Carsland, uh, <coughs> smaller units, standard, and we manage that, plus some social housing and rent subsidies and all that. Mm. We'd like to build a new lodge. The lodge is, is older. It's in not bad shape. We have currently, what was it on the waiting list the other day? Was it 40? people on the waiting list, uh, more s couples than we've had in a while. Of course, we, we can't accommodate them. We'd like to build a new one. We'd like to partner with uh, the Hospice Society. And, and, and they would have a few beds them. in there? Yeah. And uh, repurpose the existing lodge if it's... Uh, mm affordable housing or maybe it's extended care. We were in dire need of more extended care in, in the area too. Right now families are broke up. You've heard the story, you yep. gotta go to Oles or Vulcan or someplace, right? There is a definite need for that. And I thought we were had the ear there for a while in this last year it's kind of dropped off that the interest, I don't know if it's election time or the cycling is wrong, I don't know. But it is, uh, for us, it's an important thing. Uh, how many units does Wheatland County Housing Authority manage overall, do you know? Units or beds? Beds is fine. Beds. Uh, there's about, I think we can have about 99 right now in the lodge. Okay. Uh, Sunset and Giffen, they're senior self-contained. I'm guessing here 60-ish. Mm -hmm. We have, in Rocky Ford, there's six. Standard, there's four. Yeah. Gleeson, four, I think. And Carsland, four. There might be six in Galician. I'm not sure about Galician. Okay. So coming and, up to uh, as far yeah. as other properties that we rent out and pro probably 15, 18 right. These are residences. We have about 50 on rent subsidy programs. Okay. There are some direct rent subsidies and there are landlord rent subsidy right. ones, both, both. And the waiting list on them are probably in the 60, 70 range. Okay. So, yeah, just even the... And that's a partnership between which municipalities? The county? Strathmore. Strathmore. Rocky Ford, Standard, and Azar. Got it. Azar doesn't send anybody to the board. Uh, Standard more yep. or less looks after them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, you know, the Mountain View County has been very successful in their lodge programs in terms of getting um, partnerships with the, the provincial government. So I don't know exactly where uh, Wheatland Housing Authority is um, in that process, but I know that <clears throat> um, uh, up at Troshu, St. Mary's Covenant Health is currently working uh, closely with Mountain View Seniors Housing uh, to try to get a, a, a bit of a, a stronger application uh, for that facility up um, in Troshu. So 
um, you know, we may be able to make some connections on ways that we can, you know, from a wider region, mm -hmm. uh, try to help be successful. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to meet with the housing authority uh, at some point in time here in the near future as well and get a, a better grasp. I'll have um, Brenda, uh, who works in the Olds office, uh, reach out to the housing authority and connect with them as well. Um, I, I will do my best to um, be active on, you know, some of these larger organizations and smaller ones, really, um, but wherever possible to provide assistance and, and um and help. Um, I guess one th one other thing that I would say: the current constituency office is in Olds, uh, which is obviously very convenient for the people of uh, this end of the constituency. So uh, we will be making a commitment of some nature, whether it's uh, once a month, a few times a month, uh, to have the office uh, run community office hours somewhere in this. Uh, quarter or quarter uh, of the constituency, whether it happens right in Rockyford or whether we go into Strathmore um, and utilize the the member's uh, office or uh, I was in Iracan at a council meeting last night and they're very excited to be basically the dead center of the constituency now. So, um, so uh, I say that to say that we will be um, operating um, regional office won't be open daily or anything but um, efforting to to have a presence uh, so that members of this part of the constituency don't have to drive two hours or right. two and a half hours to to connect with the office or with me directly so um, but I will have Brenda reach out to the housing uh, society and and connect with them and see uh, what ways we could um, work together to sort of advance that okay. cause yeah presently we've got our concept plan done oh great and uh, we're just waiting for funding to move on to the yes architect stage uh, yeah i guess a uh, tender out for architects uh, mm -hmm. and it's kind of stalled at that uh, right it's been a year now so okay yeah. okay we'll uh, keep you informed we'll be get you out to a board meeting one night yeah that'd be great i'd be more than happy okay. to attend okay yeah you bet. Any other issues? You busy tomorrow? <laughs> linear? Degradation of our linear assessment. Mm -hmm. That's uh we're losing a lot. An ongoing plus people are starting not to pay now. Yeah. Yeah. And we have how much did it impact the budget year over year? In the last three years, we've seen a 20% reduction every year for the last three years. It's been just quite substantial. And then, of course, we haven't been hit as hard as some of the other ones, Nathan, as far as non-payment. Uh, but I think we're, last time I checked, we're in arrears about $680,000. And a big portion of that is school tax that obviously the province is starting to step up to the plate. But. That's a huge concern for us. And we have one funding, the CRISP funding, we call it. It's just a direct payment to the municipalities. And it's, uh, the amount of that is, uh, is, a, is derived from our linear. But we end up taxing, you know, all non-res to get the, the money. But that's where it comes from. In an effort to share that with the other municipalities, we're going to have to in the future, if that keeps decreasing, we'll have to, you know, adjust that. How would you describe the relationship with your, uh, and maybe this is an unfair question to ask, but um, since we've just met, I'll ask it anyway. Yes. Um, how would you describe the relationship uh, with the county and its um, urban slash municipal partners? You should have been here last night. We had a regional meeting. We have four a year with all the municipalities. We had a, a very good attendance last night. We had a hospice society come in. They're uh, new, well, they're not that new. They're five-year-ish, 
raise the money to build a hospice. And, uh, there's a lot of support and, uh, in the area for sure. Uh, I say our our relationship is improving for sure. We've uh, partnered with Strathmore to build a, a, a field house type thing on mm. the school. It'll be opening. Maybe you'll get an invitation. Uh, I would say the end of October and November. We got a report yesterday. Uh, the villages, yeah, we help them when they ask. We'll give them gravel or mm -hmm. fix a road or plus this crisp funding that's about hundred thousand dollars for each village. It's wow. it's significant for them for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we uh, when we're asked, we uh, we do what we can for them. Super. I might just say that uh, the next time you have your regional meeting, I'd be more than happy to try. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I can, what my schedule will be like. I assume you have some sort of December get together or January twenty first. Oh, January twenty first. <laughs> yeah, here at the yeah. county, and it's here at this office. Yeah. Seven o'clock at night. Yeah. I'll just, uh, I'll throw uh, it in. Glenn, uh, maybe talk about our regional water corp. Yeah, that's tomorrow. We're having a grand opening of our, we have a new water line center at Standard. That's where our treatment plant is. The reservoir is close to Standard, five mile away about. One leg of the pipeline goes down into Galician. Mm -hmm. That's been running for half a year or more. And the other one's up to Rocky Ford and it's been running for a couple months. And the grand opening's tomorrow at Standard at three o'clock and there will be tour of the water treatment plant and and uh, I don't know if there'll be anything out to the reservoirs or not but to me the reservoirs are the nicest part I love that view mm -hmm. up there <laughs> we're gonna have to uh, there'll be no subdivisions around there no but uh, yeah if you're the only other issues one of the phases was to get water to Rosebud and Hazar. Hazar's, uh, they're on wells, so's Rosebud. Hazar is not, they're going through a viability study right now. Mm -hmm. It's up with the minister right now. I think all the steps have been filled. It's up to the minister to decide what the next step is, right? And Rosebud, if we would, could get funding for that, they're, it's on wells and uh, yeah, it's well water, and we've had Alberta Environments had some comment about our water wells in the past. So. As they do. I, I'm not sure. I'm, Did you the say water is safe. The water is safe. Tomorrow it's, yeah, yeah, tomorrow at Standard. Standard yeah. tomorrow. At 3 o'clock at the water treatment plant. Yeah. If you can make it, that would be nice. I have to move one thing, so I won't say yes yet, but I will try to move one thing. Okay. Excellent. Hmm. Anything else we're forgetting here? Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time, and I know you have uh, lots of important things to do, and uh, today I, yeah, well, and yeah, <laughs> that's the problem. Thanks for putting me between lunch and other important things. Um, <laughs> But I, some of you may or may not know, I, I do come from uh, the municipal background in that I was on council for a couple of terms in the community of Carstairs. So I uh, am well aware of all of the uh, hard work that mm -hmm. it is to run smaller municipalities and uh, the, the great work that takes place in our, uh, in our county cousins. And uh, when things are working well together, it is uh, spectacular. And when they're not, it is uh, exciting, to say the least. So um, uh, so thank you so much for everything you do for your communities and, uh, and our region. And look forward to being able to uh, build a relationship with you that uh, hopefully is um, perhaps, uh, and this is just me speculating, but perhaps more productive than it's been in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks. Thank nice to meet you. I guess we'll break for, for lunch. <laughs> Some sticky buck. Yeah.
Just give me that too. Yeah. Gets worse, so I'll have to leave. Okay, I'd like to call a meeting to order. And uh, we have uh, our MLA, Derek's here today. And we're, uh, we're here to talk about Green for Life compost facility. So I don't know, Derek, do you, do you have anything you wanted to say first? Or? I might have a few things. Hmm? I might have a few things to say. Okay. Turn the mic on, please. I might have to leave. I got a issue here. No disrespect. Just push the button. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, Council, uh, for having me and uh, constituents who are here today. Um, uh, Green for Life and other names that uh, this site has gone under has been one of the most important and least fruitful files that uh, I have dealt with since being elected as the MLA for Strathmore Brooks. Uh, from day one as the MLA for this area, I have had um, many, many of the people who are here today, some of who have driven me uh, through the fields and we've walked through and I've uh, visited the site multiple times. Uh, from day one, uh, GFL and its predecessors, um, it was, it's been a problem, but earlier on I was hopeful that we could find some kind of compromise. I've always sought to work with council in seeking direction, uh, only ever uh, dealing with, uh, you know, this being a primarily municipal issue, only going so far as council's been prepared to go. Uh, it is my reading of this council that this council is prepared to go further than the previous council, uh, which I think is very positive and needed. Uh, Mr. Scott Klassen, who represents the area, has been very helpful in keeping me appraised of the situation uh, from the county. He's been, you know, very clear not to speak on behalf of council, but on behalf of himself, his constituents, and, and you know, any direction from council. He's been very clear what that is. Uh, but he's, he's been a, a very big advocate to this and very helpful. Um, I have done absolutely everything in my power to work with these people. I've tried to sit down and negotiate. I've had private meetings previously. Uh, they have made promises to me, they've made promises to constituents and property owners, they've made promises to you, the council and county, and uh, these things have not been kept. And, uh, and it's the, la the latter stages of this, they now even refuse to sit down for private meetings. And uh, I've, I was always of the opinion that if you can solve things man-to-man, uh, -man, one -on one-on-one, in private, where there's uh, no face to be lost and you can just speak honestly, then we can make, we can depoliticize this, that this doesn't have to be a public political issue in the media and uh, their complete unwillingness to speak even privately um, when they refer us purely to lawyers with uh, Environment Alberta is an indication to me that there is no goodwill uh, to even the pretense of negotiation or compromise. So I'm of the opinion that it's time uh, we as a community took action. There is no more talk with these guys. We have to force them to the table or beat them at this point. Uh, Environment Alberta uh, has been inexplicably absent from this. Uh, I've got a reasonably decent relationship with the Minister of the Environment, uh, despite whatever political differences there would be. Uh, but the Ministry of the Envir uh, Depart uh, Environment Alberta sticks its nose into all sorts of business that it shouldn't be. It overreaches into all sorts of business that it shouldn't. It st stopped people from accessing their own driveways if it floods in the spring. But they are unwilling to touch a toxic uh, waste site without, that does not have proper authorization and is significantly damaging the... Uh, quality of life and rights of property owners in the area. Uh, it is up to Environment Alberta to live up to their name. They're not doing their job. I've requested that they they do something about this, that they exercise what's proper, and they've complete they've shown a complete unwillingness to do anything whatsoever. 
So uh, I'm very grateful to be invited here by Council to speak today. Um, my sense from you all is that uh, there's a willingness to move forward, that uh, all of the goodwill that you've shown and local people have shown to dealing with GFL and its predecessors uh, has all been for naught. And I think that's extraordinarily unfortunate. Uh, I never want to be a part of hurting any business in the area, big business or small business, but uh, when they're not willing to cooperate whatsoever with the community and the people they share the area with, then it's time to do something else. Um, I have a strong fear that GFL being a very large international corporation has uh, outsized political influence across different parties and governments that uh, many people are just afraid to take them on because of the huge influence that they exercise. And I want people to know that they have no influence over me. I don't care what they do coming towards me. And I hope that all of you take the same position that we serve the local people here. We do not serve uh, outside corporate interests. We serve the local people here. We welcome businesses to come here. We welcome corporations here to create jobs. But they have to be a part of sharing in this community and, and living uh, together with the people uh, they share the area with. So. Um, I would be very happy to take any questions Council has on this issue or any of the other uh, issues that, uh, that, uh, that you would like to ask me about. Although I know we're dealing with GFL today, if there's any other issues. Happy to take your questions, but I would strongly encourage the Council uh, to take this issue very seriously. We, we've, we've been everybody's been trying with the best of intentions for years to find a compromise and to deal with them in good faith, and I don't think that we can go down that route anymore. I think it's time that we take the gloves off. Thanks, Derek. Is there any questions, comments? Uh, more comment. Um, NAP had an AGM on September 11th that I attended. Um, most of the people are here, and there was probably about 40, I'd say about 40 people were there. Um, they're very happy with the report that the county had got from Dr. Dale McCartney um, from June. It was circulated to people and, of course, it addressed pretty much all the issues, I would say. Um, and I shared with them that we'd forwarded that on to AEP and have really received no response as of yet. Um, the people there want something done further. They were... Uh, we talked about different options, and some of them, I mean, it's spending taxpayers' dollars, right? So um, there's really been, like Derek said, there's been no, there's been an openness to bring these people to the table several times. There's been that council many, many times, and um, we're not really gaining any ground. We're doing all the right steps. So I do believe that uh, we need to, need to take a step forward, and um, I would like to put a motion forward. Um, Basically, I want to put a motion forward to direct, to, direct, to direct staff to research an aggressive envir environmental lawyer to pursue an RFP to resolve ongoing concerns at the compost site located at Southwest 72524 West of the 4th. It's approximately 16 acres. And referencing um, Daryl's report that pretty much outlined all the issues um, and corrective actions that need to be taken. And... Uh, bring it up forward and we need to see how much it's going to cost and council needs to make that decision. So my, my motion is what I stated and I'd be entertain any questions. Questions? Go ahead, Amber. I just have a question. What your plans are going forward, like you're saying, throw off the gloves, you know, what is your plan for addressing this in the future? So I'm always careful in keeping in mind that this is both a municipal and a provincial issue. Environment Alberta and anything dealing with municipal affairs is nebulously uh, provincial and uh, and municipal. Uh, so it's always been my policy never to interfere in areas of municipal jurisdiction, even where I've disagreed with municipal governments uh, in our constituency. But uh, but to uh, where we have agreement to champion the will of. Uh, municipal governments and if it is the will of this council to uh, 
to move forward with a plan that, uh, that I would agree with, then I'll do everything in my power to champion that. Um, the unwillingness of Environment Alberta to do anything about this is inexplicable to me, considering the things that they stick their nose into that they have uh, little or no business sticking their nose into, but then will not deal with a toxic waste dump uh, right where people live is is inexplicable. And I, I fear that it would just be that it is the influence of the corporation that owns it. And I, I hope that that's not the case. I hope that it's, I hope that it's incompetence. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if it is the will of the council, and I will not interfere in your debate, this is an internal debate that you're having, but if, if it is the will of the council to support uh, Councillor Klassen's motion uh, to at least look into the cost of a lawyer, uh, it's always been my position, and I've, I've spoken to many of the people who are here today and recommended for some time that they may need to seek a lawyer of their own from NAP, um, that there's a very clear property rights violations here, in addition to just inv violating environmental, uh, potentially in, uh, violating environmental laws, they are, uh, GFL is significantly impeding the enjoyment of people's private property in the adjacent areas to the site. Uh, so there would be a private, uh, a potential private case to be made for compensation and action. I've, I've many, of, many of you here, I've, you know I've recommended this. Lawyers ain't cheap. Um, governments tend to be the only ones who can afford lawyers ad nauseum. But, you know, uh, this is a municipal government. It's smaller and it's not unlimited resources the way provinces and the federal government tend to treat lawyers. So I would encourage you to be cautious whenever you're engaging in a legal battle with a large corporation with this, the costs involved. But um, I, I certainly think it's something worth exploring. I, I think the courts might be the route to take at this point. Uh, the, those with the political ability, the executive ability to make these decisions aren't willing to touch it. And again, I can only speculate about why that would be uh, for self, for, for people who I know care about the environment aren't willing to touch this. So I think the courts may be the route that has to be taken. I've told many of the people here today that for, for several years, <coughs> thought, it may just come to that. My, my first... My preference has always been to find a compromise, to work with these people, to find something that can work. I, I don't see why we can't find something that, that, that cannot work for everybody, that at least everybody is mutually unhappy. But that's not the case. So I, I would encourage council to at least carefully consider the motion. If, uh, if council goes down this road uh, I, and, uh, and accepts this, uh, I will be an ally for you and do what I can and I would encourage at least some measure, if it's cause if it's appropriate legally, to to work with NAP uh, <coughs> and MAP uh, NAP members to consider a pri a private suit at the same time uh, for the damages to their the enjoyment of their own private property. Jason, we sat here a while back, and uh, the talk of law lawyers has been going on for quite some time now. Um, and I think I think council was pretty clear in the last <coughs> meeting that we did have intent to go this route, and perhaps I was being a little irrational, saying we should do it right now and go full head on. And and now that we have a report and an actual case that looks better than was before, I think we have a very strong shot at bringing some justice to this development. And I, I truly believe uh, Councillor Klassen has done all he can and in looking at every aspect of this law, potential lawsuit. And I'd even go further in saying, in my own opinion, if we must go after the landowner herself, we will, not just GFL. I think, I think we have to look at that option as well. So. so through through the chair, uh, my understanding of the motion then uh, from from Councillor Clausen is that we're investigating the the cost. We're not hiring at this time. We're investigating the cost and what's the ramifications of it are. Is that 
Okay. Yes, um, because the cost could be substantial, I think it's important that we be upfront with what it is. And I believe there'll be some policies involved in how much it could possibly be that we have to entertain. That's why I just saying to go out and hire one, that's why I said it carefully that way. Because um, an RFP gives us, or RFD, request for decision, gives us those options as council. But at least we start that process forward and then everything's out in the public as to what we have to do. Unless there's something from staff that says we don't have to do that, but I'm pretty sure that's the way, the way we have to go, so. So you say in an RFD and an RFP? Um, I'd, I'd prefer an RFD, request for a decision with some options and applicable policies that we have to follow. Does that sound appropriate? Any other thoughts, comments? I got lots from the public. No okay. uh, further question then <clears throat> you're saying RFD request for decision not a request for proposal and uh, you so does that mean we're moving forward with this or are we going to look and see what the cost is before we move forward with this what's the difference between an uh, RFD and an RFP Alan well, the way I understand, uh, Count Deputy Reef Clawson has requested that we bring back information on what the cost would be. Uh, okay. I won't be able to give you an accurate number on that because lawyers will never give you an, they'll give you an hourly cost, so I can bring back some recommendations on that. But uh, okay. that's, that's your direction, I understand. Some options, um, because you're gonna, I'd like to get a different op opinion other than what we currently have. Someone with an okay, environment. Okay, we've got two opinions. Mm -hmm. And they both came back of similar vein mm -hmm. from two I'd different, like someone with from an two different law firms not associated with each other, but they were not environmental lawyers. Yeah. You're asking for an environmental lawyer. I think someone in an environmental background that could follow this because I think it's going to be quite a challenge. Um, and ha to have a couple different options would be good for counsel. Okay. I'm just wondering timeline, how soon could we have something back? As long as we have a chance to, re to see what, what we're getting into before we throw the final roping, not to be disrespectful or anything else, but I've heard that, you know, I'll back you till I bleed statement before. Yeah, I think our next meeting is October 2nd, and I don't think I'd have all the information put together in a, that fashion. So the next meeting after that is November 6th, and that's where I would shoot for, uh, if that's okay with council. Hello, my name is Danielle Harwood, and I just have a few questions today. Um, first one, what's the difference between that RFD and RFP? RFD is a request for
Okay. That's the thing. Right. Okay. So Alan had just said there has is a lawyer retained, or there was two already decided on, or. No. Sorry, they, uh, they're not maybe of environmental lawyers personally. Okay, I don't know if they had guidance from them, I don't know. So this one is more pointed to, uh, to uh, ask an environmental lawyer. Okay. Okay. Um, I request or wonder if everyone's here today and this has been on the table for this long hearing it pushed to possibly November, I think very frustrates us as a group. And we don't understand, or I'd like to wonder or ask if we could possibly do an RFD today. I know it wasn't on the motion, but um, you know, to hire this, as Alan said, there's no point in looking into it. They're lawyers. If anything, it's just what's the initial retainer gonna be? And let's get this ball rolling. Um, there's enough evidence on file that these guys have avoided us avoided you guys, avoided Alberta and Parks and Environment. Um, my files alone can show that, I can prove that. I have shared a lot of it, I could share more. Um, I do have other documentation I'd like to submit today. Um, so I would ask, can you guys vote today on this RFD and uh, possibly- We don't have an RFD in front of us. The idea of the RFD is to gain uh, who we could hire maybe how much it will cost for this lawyer. Uh, maybe there's one or two or three different okay. lawyers. Okay, that, okay, that's what the RFD okay. is, request for decision. It's a choosing type thing. So to pick the actual lawyer, okay. Yeah, that would be. Sounds good. Okay, so to my original questions then, um, when was the last time an on-site tax assessment was performed on that site? Does anybody know? Tax assessment. I yeah. don't know if there's. It's agricultural, if I understand it. We'd have to get the tax guy in, but I don't know if there's much tax on it personally. Is there, Ellen? There is a component that's a commercial taxation on it. Uh, I'd have to check and see when that was last done. Was that Typically, it has to be done every five years. Okay. But I don't know where it is on the rotation, but I could certainly find that out. Because I thought in, the, in your guys' rules, it had just changed recently to one or two years. Uh, no, the, the mandate from the province is every five years. Five years? Yeah, that's the rotation. Okay. Some properties may incur a review more often, okay. depending on where they're at and if they're under construction and that. But Would you suggest this place is under construction? I'm not suggesting that at all. No. Okay. Is there something we could look into to see if they're under construction? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, question uh, on top of that, what is the criteria on an assessment? Um, like I know when you guys come to our place, our tax assessment, right? If my basement's been redone or developed, you know, check mark goes and our taxes go up. So I'm wondering when a tax assessment is done on this property, you know, is it um, piles and amount of product? Is it building improvement? How would the tax assessment be put into play on this particular site? We'd have to get the tax assessor in here and answer <laughs> these questions. Through the chair, the tax assessor is under uh, provincial legislation, not uh, municipal legislation. So we have no control over what he has to go by a different set of rules. And not, we're not sure what those are. Okay, Scott thinks he has an answer. I was just looking on the file. Uh, 2017 was the last time they increased a non residential, just 16 acres, which would be that part of that parcel. So it was looked at in 2017, September. 11th, 2017. Thank you. So 17, so I'm just curious, and you just said it was under residential? No. Sorry, I'm just looking at the notes here. It's increased non-residential. Non-residential. This is all public information too. Okay. So, yeah. Um, anyway, that was just a question to follow up on my notes on the other side. Uh, another question for, I guess, county is if there's an unsafe condition on site and a bylaw officer goes to that site to investigate it, 
and they didn't get denied access into that site, what is the course of action for the county? Alan, can you add to that? So the course of action would be a notification to the property owner. Okay, notification and then, uh, sorry, um, notification and then like what's the follow-up after the notification? We typically when we provide a notification, we'd give a timeline. So if um, there's no response back within that timeline, then we do a for further follow-up. Further follow-up, okay. Um, I'm just curious, in some of the previous, we have had, I understand bylaw has been out to the site for certain bylaw offenses notice in the site, not <clears throat> sorry, I'm nervous. The uh, unsightly, I think bylaw has been called with them. Uh, how come there was no t tickets issued to them? I don't know the status of that. I would have to find that out, but I can certainly do that. Okay, thank you. Um, so only two more quick things. One is more of a statement. I'd like to make a formal request for the county to make a motion to get direct control over GFL. I know that's one of your guys' bylaws and I would like to make a formal request that I think it's time, uh, especially we were really hoping on the decision on a lawyer today. So if anything, I'd like to make a formal request to let's play that card of that uh, direct control. And I guess the last question being, um, what actions is the county willing to do today to move forward with this? We're really begging here. This has been a long time coming. We all really want to see some action taken. What can you guys do today that can make us move forward? Hire a lawyer. Is, uh, is, so let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you, you heard how long that takes to find one and whatnot. If he gets it done before the November meeting, I'm sure it'll be here in the October meeting, that, that part's a non thing. As for, I'm not a planner to, to, to change it to direct control. They're not operating under county permits. Or a, it's a environmental Alberta environment. They're the ones that we have to hold their feet to the fire and get I agree. Ask so them. If we have documentation that the uh, Alberta environment is not following up on their job, uh, if we were to submit that documentation, pardon, then I do feel if that warrants under direct control to kick in, like when does that, I guess when would that be able to be applied? To direct control, it would have to be willing on their part. I, I don't think that's a thing. To sue them, we've got to get this lawyer first. So don't throw your documentation away. You'll probably be asked for it Okay. when this lawyer gets uh, whoever it is. Okay. I don't think we're going to back down from hiring it, but we have to do our... We right. have to research out who we're going to get, right? Okay, I understand. So uh, nobody in the county... Council as a whole will make that decision. So there'll be a, whatever it is on the thing, a bio or, or past successes, I don't know, okay. right? A cost will be a determining factor. Okay. And we'll make a decision on that. And okay. if, it's, uh, if it's palatable to council that day, they'll uh, say go ahead and do it, right? Okay. So it, it would depend on, on the qualifications of, on, in this RFD. I would say. Okay. So when that's due, so uh, watch your agendas, and maybe you'll, when that comes through, you know, you can come and watch that that part of it too. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I wasn't going to go here, but I guess there's is another request I would per se, as well as direct control. I do understand there's a certain bylaw with permitted use and discretionary use, and somehow they fall in a lingo there. I think they were grandfathered into one and I'm just wondering when can you push to the other one or how does that work in county or is that something we can look at or that you guys can look at and we can make a formal request for you guys to look at. I think we'll, when we get this lawyer that we're definitely looking at that aspect. Over time, I wasn't here 20 or 25 years ago when it was okayed by the province or by the county it was uh, 
egg general thing that they just there no no formal agreement or anything and they started they got their permits from Alberta environment and uh, of course we've seen what it grew into and uh, yeah they, they probably short come some steps and somebody's responsible it'd be the yeah something <laughs> something for the lawyer to do because we don't have any staff here right that has that kind of time and, and okay. uh, yeah can we just make sure and include then when we do do this RF D or whatever that those topics are mentioned as well that the lawyer to sue them to direct control to permit a discretionary to make sure that that is all included and no one that we want all tools in the tool belt played or taken out I'm forward. thinking when the lawyer comes I'm just thinking that they'll be tasked with trying to write what's there and put controls into the future that's all we can Okay. do we can't correct what they did 10 years ago but moving forward we want more control on it we want a more accountable okay. for it right we want it cleaned up okay. and make it uh, acceptable right right that that'll be the goal sounds yeah. good okay anything else or uh, I think I'm good okay I think. I uh, just have uh, one question, and it was just brought up. As what council knows of this site, and w what we've brought since we've started this, is there anybody on this council sees this as Ag General? <laughs> anybody on this council see this as Ag General? No. And honestly, that's how you got to vote when you get this stuff going, because it's not what they what it is. So, you know, the only way you're going to fix it, and we can still beat the door down and we can bring more people. This is just, you know, people on a working day. Yeah. So we're all working hard to solve this on outside of this, and uh, we need the same coming in here. Thank you. No. Go ahead. I just had a super quick question. I'm not sure if I misunderstood. Um, so you had said that they're not operating under permits with the county. Is that correct? I think the Alberta environment are the ones who oversee the. Okay. So my question is that if I wanted to open a business on within Wheatland County, do I ha do I not have to apply a permit through Wheatland County in order to have said business? Okay. If you want to open a business in Wheatland County. Mm -hmm. You'll go to the planning department, mm -hmm. and if it's a permitted use, they would probably write up a development permit for you, and away you go. If it's a discretionary use, or maybe it's a use that doesn't fit on your land presently and it has to be rezoned, mm -hmm. then you would rezone, and uh, once it's rezoned, then you would apply for your development permit, again, if it's permitted or discretionary. If it's discretionary, you come into the Municipal Development Board and uh, Commission and you would apply for this business. And the board would either grant it or not. And if they grant it, it would have conditions. And if it's a business such as GFL, there would be conditions on there. There's a condition whether the board puts it on or not that it has to abide by all applicable legislation both provincially and federally so there are provincial statutes and federal statutes that have to be followed and if they're not followed the county would have an easier time because that was a condition mm -hmm. right presently with GFL we have none of that right so do they not have to reapply for permits like with a change of business yeah I would think so okay uh, in a perfect world that would be great so for theoretical sake let's say a company changes hands and they don't redo no, the it's permit not a change of hands it's uh, permits are applied to the land mm -hmm. okay but these are little things I'm thinking a, a 
good environmental or a good lawyer could could fret out for us because mm -hmm. that has changed from what I remember years ago to what it is today it's not the same okay. the same thing not the same feedstock not the same size of pile nothing's the same the land is the same but nothing else is so that's why I would be in favor of hiring a lawyer because of the the massive change that has occurred there, right? But what you can do about it, where where our staff is is at a loss for sure. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank okay, you. thanks. How you guys doing, Colin Huxted? Um, I have to ask a question. Uh, we all know what's happening out there and what's been happening, and now they're 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 flying under the radar somewhat, and now we have these little hubs of stuff. The the land use changes has changed a bunch. Um, they started a sulfur, an elemental sulfur fertilizer plant out there. Um, they got caught with I believe 95 times over their legal limit. Um, they then moved that stuff. They hit it out by Rocky Ford. Um, we found it out at Rocky Ford. We came back to the county and to Alberta environment. It's a hazard. It's a fire hazard. That was dealt with. No tickets. No questions where it came from, where it's going to. We just found it again three months ago. Um, it's right here. So you guys can walk when there's an east wind. You can smell it getting in your car out here. Um, if you want to look at some... Um, information it happened in South Africa it's happened in other places last fall we had it and that's why I can't sit down and not say something about it today because we have a hazard out there three months ago I brought it forward nothing's been done but we had a big fire go through here last year if that fire was on this side there's probably 8,000 10,000 ton of that stuff hidden in a field and if it catches fire nobody around this area even knows it's there Nobody even knows how to react to it. Your own fire department doesn't know how to react to it. And uh, my question is, how much longer is this going to keep going before somebody has to die or something serious has to happen? And it's them finding hubs and people that are wanting that little payout. And uh, I don't see how we can't say that it isn't a change of land use. Um, I used to own a compost facility. I know the regulations. I know what I've had to go through. They're still conflicting back and forth on feedstock and how much feedstock. Sulfur has nothing to do with it. Um, drywall has nothing to do with it. And uh, they had 40,000 ton of that stuff hit out there. Your own report, great report. The guy did the stuff. Now you need a good environmental lawyer. Three years ago, when I was first asked by an older lady that has now passed away to get involved in this, I put my name out there. I got served a cease and desist. I got threatened to be bought out or sued. Um, they bullied me. Um, I came to county asking for help, and it's time for you guys to help. And uh, I had a lawyer lined up in a week. It was an environmental specialist that said she'd love to take it on, but she thought maybe we needed to start suing the landowner, Alberta Environment, and if our county isn't helping us, the county. And then uh, I met with Knapp, and uh, I, I got my sort of cease and desist, so I stepped back, and Knapp went a different direction, thinking that the county was coming aboard and was going to help us. Um, you guys have stepped up a lot, but there's a lot more to do. And if this was in any of your guys' neighborhood, you wouldn't put up with it, but now it's right next to building, next to your building. And if it caught fire and there was an east wind, you guys are all toast. Nobody has an emergency plan. Nobody even knows it's there. Well, three months ago, I brought it forward. But I don't know what, you're, what, what you guys, if it's caught fire today, where are you going? I have pictures of it. But where are you guys going to go? And how many people have to die? And check about what happened in South, uh, South uh, or Africa and see what happened. And it was 15 miles away. And it drifted into their town. And that's all I have to say. This is just a warning to all of you is that there's some bad stuff right out your doorstep. And I haven't got no responses back. I know the county was going to send out their bylaw. I don't hear nothing. Can I ask that question? 
What's that? I can't hear. It's in Amber Zone, and uh, and Scott knew about it. Do you, do you guys have any? Have you had any reports from your own staff on what they're going to do about it, or has anybody investigated it? The only information that I've had was just somebody asked if I was aware of it, and I wasn't. They asked if I could like do what I can, but as a counselor, obviously, it's not my purview to be investigating these things. Um, I'm trying to think who asked. This, but this is a hazard out there. Like I don't know if you've seen sulfur fires and stuff, and they're at, you're allowed a hundred ton. And right now in Alberta, it's not even licensed anymore. It's been shut down. It's elemental sulfur and, and compost. It is now they're doing it in BC, BC and Saskatchewan. In Alberta, it's not even here. But I know Alberta Environment was notified about it, but. We never get any response back what's, what's going to happen, but I can't sit back. After that big fire you guys just had, if that hits over here, how many people are dead? And, and, and why hasn't somebody done something? Like, it's time. And that's all I have to say. Uh, Colin, uh, this lawyer you have, could you provide the name to I to believe Ellen? I provided it to Knapp a while back. Provide it to Ellen for our okay. RFD, okay. And, and that's what they are, they're environmental specialists, and that's what they thought is that we should be suing Alberta Environment, and she said, mm -hmm. you'll get attention. And maybe that's all we need, but um, here, I, I never, I said I was done talking, but you got me back. <laughs> um, I was threatened by GFL a while back, that they were gonna buy me out or break me, and if I didn't be quiet and get napped to be quiet, they were gonna send their two nastiest lawyers out from Toronto to make all our lives miserable. That's the company you're working with. And uh, I never did well with bullies. And I don't think that we need to be bullied by them. And, and I, somebody brought up a thing that maybe you need to go after the landowner. Maybe that's where you gotta start somewhere. But I think we should start suing whoever has to be to so somebody takes notice and fixes things. But it's, it's just a hub. The other stuff is hidden in other places. And another site out in Okotoks where they're hiding it. It's wherever they can hide the stuff. And this is a full-blown operation that they got working, and I know you guys have no permits on that. So fill me in on uh, in my elemental. opinion, without prejudice. Okay, <laughs> with, with uh, elemental sulfur, and if it catches fire, how easy will it catch fire, and what's the dangers? Well, it, it in my opinion, without prejudice, it caught fire out by our place several times, and it takes a while to get going, but they don't notice it. But when it, when it starts going, then there's a blue, and that's sulfur dioxide that comes out. And the last time that it was out there, it pinned a bunch of cattle into the corner. Um, it drifts into all the low spots. Um, <laughs> How bad I, it's the gas, is it? it, it I, I think Mr. Or? Armstrong could probably say something about that. I think he's had some experiences where he's seen a video on how it burns. Um, it gags you, it, it drops you to the ground. And uh, I don't know what eight or 10,000 ton would do to you, but I know you're only allowed to store 100 ton. Like that's four end dump loads. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to put a picture up on the thing, we could do that, but this, this is enough to bury this whole office here right. that's stored out there right now. And okay. it's right next to an irrigation ditch. The one that was at uh, Rocky Fort, it was on a side hill, maybe a half a mile from Crowfoot Creek. So when it rained, that stuff run down and into the creek. Um, Alberta Environment was out there, but there was some BS on where, where it came from and where it was going, and this farmer was just storing it. You're allowed 100 ton, not 8 and 10,000 ton. You're in business. Okay. Somewhere it's got to stop. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm afraid by not saying something, if we get on fire, this office here could be wiped out. There's schools where it could drift into. There's people all the way around it, and it's our responsibility. If I know about it, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. And if doing the right thing was easy, everybody would do it. So that's right. Don't be intimidated by these guys. They're not known as a good bunch of people, neither. In okay. my opinion, without prejudice. Thank you, Scott. You had your hand up. Um, in regards to the the piles, we, I've seen the pictures, and, and I won't deny that. Um, but we've also forwarded on to the governing body that we respond to in regards to that stuff. Same ones that you talked to that day. 
and they don't seem to think there's a problem. I have a problem with that. Yeah, it's not uh, your neighborhood. I, I understand. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. That's why the motion's here, because to bring in somebody that can look at the whole file and decide which approach is best for us. Is it the landowner? Is it DEP? Is it whatever? That's what I want someone to give us the opinion on. What is the best approach for us to take from a legal opinion? Because we have more documentation now. We have, we have the, we've done the, the Daryl report. has been done, and it's very well written. It's, it's got key issues in, involved. And then any other information that's out there, and take the facts and move forward. And, I, and, and the issues that I want the lawyer to deal with is what the county deals with. If there's any civil or anything like that, I, just, I was clear it now. That's not our place. So. Okay. Can we direct administration to look into this? If, if, it's, if the pile's as big as, as claimed, I would assume there's got to be some sort of uh, some sort of a, 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 um, permit they have to get because uh, I know I can't just go ahead and do whatever I don't think unless they're allowing me to do that then but I think there's got to be some something in place here so that uh, if it is as big as if it is that big and if there is a if there is a, a, a hazard um, a hazmat to it so can we get administration to look into it and send a bylaw officer out there and Take some photographs so that we have the photographs and and why does it have to come to this to get your bylaw out there? This has been brought how long ago, Colin? Three months. Three months. When did the Arrow do report? And we gotta come in here and, and, and enforce these issues? This should have been done already to protect the people. And why are we doing all the work? We're finding it. We're looking out for it. We're checking all these things. Where, where's the people? Oh, we've got to give Dennis a ticket for a seatbelt. That's, that's going to make a big difference on the hazards in this county. It's not being handled. This stuff is being put off and put off. It's like the first meeting we had here. The same issues have come up. Well, we've got to look into it, Mr. Kester. You know, you, you wanted to... Uh, we got to we got to find the right things. Well, we're still looking for the right things, aren't we? We all know they got to be sued. Please, please stop putting it off. Please find a way to get this done. It's just one thing after the next. I hear. Well, we should look into that. Well, we should look into this. We bring the facts to you, and they don't get acted on. Um, can we submit a picture? Maybe we could put it up on screen of this compost facility where you could pass on the phone to the council of this facility that Colin's talking about. It has much more than 100 tons. 100 tons of three dump truck loads, roughly. There's two excavators and you could hardly see them. Using your zone amber story. Definitely, like we say, like, um, like you had said, sir. Um, you had said, you know, can I just go dump this in my backyard? And I guess it's, it's an environment's problem. The county, there's got to be something that, you know, people just can't go dump this much raw sulfur anywhere in your county. Can I see it? You definitely can. How about it even in one spot? It's this is from this week. This and is this east is, of here? And this is not a GFL. This is less than two miles from this building. So if that lights fire and the smoke comes our way, smoke from toxic is smoke from sulfur is toxic. Mm -hmm. And that's what will kill you. Less than two miles. Now you guys are in danger, not just us. So I guess welcome to the club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, have yeah, yeah, <laughs> we have membership clubs outside if you'd like to join. Go ahead. <laughs> just uh uh, Scott, um, I think we've seen what a lawyer can do without clear direction with the fire bylaw. I think so to ask a lawyer the best way forward, you might not always get the best way forward. I mean, they're, they're going to pick the easiest and most expensive route that they're going to find. So uh, I, I fully agree with your motion, but could we make it a little more specific in saying 
we we this is what we want to do rather than look at what's the best way forward or the best possible way because if we just check off all the boxes and go after like Mr. Huxted said Alberta environment landowner and GFL rather than one of the other or not this one or that one I, I think uh, I mean even if it costs a bit more you might might get somewhere faster and I know as I said earlier about the nuisance property um, in Namaka, those people, that's the stuff that they want their money spent on. They could care less about dust control, care less about it's normal, to be honest. They just want the issues at hand solved. So I, I think I would just ask that the motion directly <coughs> tells the lawyer what to do. Because I'm tired of having the lawyer just come up with stupid, stupid pop ways of doing things just to make a buck. Because that's what they are. They're just very poor people. Poor, poor people. Go ahead. Absolutely, Jason. Um, that's clear direction is great. Um, I have no problem with that. I just wanted to open up general for discussions to, to get it moving forward. So if we want to re refine it down. If you want to put a motion, if you want to put an amendment to it, and put some clear definitions, or I can't, it's up to you. So I'd like to then include direction to pursue the landowner, pursue the company current in operation, and and Alberta Environment and Parks. So you want me to bring? <laughs> you request a request for decision. For lawyers to bring that no. back to council with that direction, to pursue that. You're not. Direction. You're not asking to hire a lawyer at this time, correct? Yeah. You guys are going to pick the which one, right? Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I understand what you're asking. And I think that's where there's a lot of merit in Scott's motion. Is, I mean, I know it looks like we're pushing it down, but we want to be able to pick the one that is going to go after all three. That's going to have the most teeth that will not just have a bit of bark. We want something with a little bite. Uh, that, Because, I mean, you probably say that we're going to go after Alberta Environment. A lot of lawyers won't want to deal with that. So we want to make sure we pick the best one. That's where, even if we, if we do have to, I mean, government's slow, slower than I ever thought. And I, if you go out and do this, you can do, get it done way faster. But we have to do this too. And, I mean, if it takes us November, I mean, it's going to take us till November. So... But at least we do it, get the right guy or girl in that case. So, Now, I'd like to bring a motion forward that we direct staff to look into the sulfur pile at number 21 and 1 and see what can be done, whether proper protocol has been followed or whatever. So. I can get to the legal yeah. Monsell's property. Is there any other areas that we know of right now in Wheatland County? No discussion. All all in favor. Carried. And uh like to thank you all for coming in. <laughs> Arlene, Eileen, you wanted to say something, or?
for the newer counselors, um, I'm just going to repeat a bit. You haven't been here, but this, like they, everybody says, it's been going on for a long, long time. Uh, why was GFL allowed not to, to not participate in the assessment and allowed to refuse to let Dr. McCartney visit the site? County Council, you have now set a precedent, precedent that any county resident has every right to not allow any county official in any capacity on their property. What's good is for one is good for all. One of the many issues with this GFL facility is a legacy pile not being dealt with in a timely manner. If this wasn't such a serious situation, health-wise, safety, and knowing GFL doesn't give a damn by not even notifying adjacent residents by having a phone list to let them know of a fire, deadly odors, etc. Last fall, 2017, a spokesperson for GFL said that in January of 2018, they would be removing the legacy pile. They are liars to the core. It has not moved at all. Maybe with the weeds growing on top of it, GFL think people will believe they are trees. GFL, BioCan, and I believe BioCycle are possibly the same entity, especially when the same spokesman has spoken for all of them. So I would caution you, there could be another change of name from GFL to something else when you start working with a lawyer. Why does GFL bring this compost material out to Gail Cleves Knight's facility when they have one in Southeast Calgary? It would save them time, reduce their expenses, etc. The answer, perhaps they would not allow much of the product as they are at a, at a facility in Wheatland County and material would not be accepted there, nor the amounts hauled. GFL are operating this compost site with absolute no concern for anyone but their own profit. They pick their spots in rural Alberta and make it pure hell for those people living not only close by but miles away. Recommendation to Wheatland County Council, A, no more new compost material of any kind allowed to come into the site now. Legacy pile first to be moved out as it is high priority to see if the groundwater has not been contaminated, etc. If no one would come and clean it up at GFL's expense, then you know how bad this comp compost site really is. Remember, Council, as it stands now, any county resident has every right to not allow any county official in any capacity on their property. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I have the legal address for where that site is. Southeast 1424-24, Southeast 1424-24, west of the fourth. Roll number 65000000. Yeah. There's okay. a gravel pit in the area. Okay, I'd like the thanks coming in. Well, uh, Amber. Glenn, do you want to just differentiate between somebody entering like a private commercial or composting facility for like the, we have to differentiate because it's not I it's not accurate that we have to differentiate between like a tax assessment purpose and having our consultant there for a reporting purpose. Can you speak to that? Just to clarify, I just don't want there to be a misperception about about our uh, we heard this morning bylaw officers just couldn't enter the site at, uh, for inspection at Nomeka. You have to ask for permission. I think uh, I'm not an expert. We'd have to get somebody who knows. But uh, the tax assessors can, they can't enter your house, but they can walk around your house. I don't know what all the different rules are, but I know uh, most instances we ask for permission just because we're the county and we're here to serve people but we can't go wherever we want either there, there are restrictions unfortunately that's the way it is so we have another appointment at two and then that's it for the day thanks a lot thank you for hearing us today yeah. And uh, by no means we have any hard feelings. We just want to get it solved. Okay, guys? Yeah, same here. Take care.
Thank you. Ryan Cummins. Yeah. Hard to know what to do. Try to do the right thing, right? I didn't know about the file. Did, did I miss something? Was it recorded? I didn't. I didn't know. I think it was actually Scott that asked me if I knew if there was a file there. I told you. Yeah, I didn't know. I said, no, I don't know that there's a file there. That's the first picture I've seen. I saw one last night. But I've never seen documentation say it was 100 times. Off. So bud is off. Yeah. We just threw it all on the environmental environment. <laughs> 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 I noticed that. I thought it highlighted. <laughs> Afternoon. What are we going to do first? Okay. Both sides. I didn't pay for it. Who's speed bump right in front of the No, evidently not. That's true. You didn't think you were the surface off. Okay, you ready, Brian? Uh, yes. So, good afternoon, Council. Um, Thanks for having, having us in here to present the operating capital budget to you guys today. So this is our first draft. Um, it's a rough draft, and what we're hoping today to provide is kind of the direction that administration has gone w with the budgets and perhaps to uh, receive council feedback and direction on however you guys would like to proceed. So on page uh, 350, or 378 of your agenda is the RFD. So what I'll do is I'll do a presentation on... First, I'll start with the operating budget, and then second, I'll go with the capital budget. So if there's any questions at any time, feel free to ask. Um, yeah, any questions you have, feel free to bring them forward. So um, maybe I'll kind of just start with just the county process on our budget. So it's very similar to prior year. So what we do is we bring kind of multiple versions to council. So we, as I mentioned, we kind of provide 
direction on how administration is heading, how, and then we take any feedback from council or staff based on updated information and kind of make those changes. Um, so there's very specific uh, parts of the MG that I do follow. The operating is under section 242 to 243. Uh, the capital is 244 and 245. So there's very specific items that we need to follow just to ensure that we meet the MGA regulations. Um, so maybe what I'll do first is I'll just kind of go over the account coding structure. Uh, I believe I had done this uh, previously, but it's always good to get a kind of a refresher anyway. So um, so what I'll do is I'll just kind of bring your attention to the general ledger code. Um, so the general ledger code is just this, uh, this string of numbers. So the string of numbers represents kind of just different items. So for the operating capital or for the operating budget, you'll only see a, the very first string being a one or a two. The one represents operating revenue and the two represents an operating expense. The second and third strings of account numbers are a very specific uh, department. So those can all be found in the summary document, um, which is right up here. So if you're looking for, let's say you're looking for an administration cost. So administration here is 1200. So you just kind of come down to here and you'll find it under tab, oops, under the administration tab, which is 1202 or 1200. So that's kind of that part of that code. Um, the fourth code is kind of a, uh, we try to make these very consistent from department to department. So the example I consistently use is operating wages. So operating wages kind of fall under um, 2100. And so if you look in administration, you'll find, whoops. Right here, so salaries administration is 2100. If you go to any other department in, in the budget, in the operating budget, you'll find the same kind of coding structure. So we'll just head down to the next one, which is assessment, which is 1214. So in 1214, you see that the, the salaries for the assessment department is two, which is the operating expense, 1214, which is the, is the assessment code, and then the 2100, which is the, the salaries. So you'll find different things such as wages and, wages and benefits. So those kind of typically run from uh, 2100 to 2199. There's other ones such as contracted services that have 2250. Uh, and just other kind of items that if you're looking for a specific item, that might be a good indication of kind of where to find it. And then finally, the last string of numbers is just if there's a, a very unique item in the budget that there's no other way to kind of break it out with an, a different identifier that's when we change the last string of that number. So this summary page here, um, which is the page one of your agenda and page 361 in your agenda package, is kind of, it's a very good indication of the revenue and expenditures that the county kind of will receive or will incur during, during the year. So what we have uh, proposed is a 2% increase of revenue of all classes. So that's residential, farmland, machinery, equipment, and non-residential. I'll get a little bit more into the taxation revenue just in a little bit. So one item I kind of wanted to just discuss with council is the, the requisition amount. So those are amounts that we receive a bill for from an external party and we pay. So one, one good thing about doing the interim budget versus the final budget is it, it provides us an opportunity to update the final budget with the actual requisition. So kind of at this point, we won't know what the requisition is until um, say April for most of, or for some of them. The, the biggest requisition that we pay is the education amount. And that's the one that the province gives us a bill for and we update our final budget and we give them an, uh, provide them four equal payments. So best estimate on 
the requisitions here. So on your left hand column here, the 2019 budget, that's what we have in there. And in the, the right hand column, the 2018 or prior year, that's kind of the, the way this budget is formatted. Just so you guys can see a comparison of previous year to this year. In the future years, you can kind of take a look at those tabs as well. So at this point, it's kind of a, an estimate on any of these requisitions. So the housing management body, we went with a 3% increase. We assume it will go up. Um, and that's based on equalized assessments between us and the other villages. Uh, the education levy, that's an amount provided by the province. We usually receive that one in March. So that's kind of what holds up the final budget, just that number specifically. The DIP requisition, that's a new requisition that just was implemented last year. And that's with the, the changes to the assessment classes with the designated industrial properties, the one the province has rolled out. Uh, the Wadamsa dispatch requisition, that's based on a per capita amount. That specific amount, it, it varies from year to year, but it is based on a per capita amount. The WFCSS requisition, that's just based on just an estimate. We won't know until we receive a requisition from them. The Drumheller waste, uh, we projected a 3% increase. Not quite sure, but we, we assume it would be in or around that range. And same with the Marigold Library requisition. So a lot of those requisitions are received either in January or February, with the exception of the education amount, which we wait for, for the final budget. So in the, to the total requisitions that the county uh, pays in, will pay roughly in 2019 is about 11.6 million. So that's a good chunk of uh, the taxation base. So the other piece I'd like to talk about is the salary and wages and benefits as well. So here we've, um, one, one item that I kind of changed from previous year is that I included all the wages of the our capital employees, which nets out with a credit in um, the construction, or it's 3,200 the Public Works Department. So it, it's similar to, pri it's very similar to prior year. We just show a, just a different way, just so we can track a little bit better internally. So. Um, depending on the uh, compensation study results, we have uh, salaries and benefits at about 2.7 or 2.2 million. So that includes all employer paid uh, benefits. So that's LAPP, health and dental, CPP, EI, critical illness. So that, that's a big chunk of it as well. Um, other expenses in the budget that we just kind of, are, are kind of larger items that I just wanted to ticket for council or illustrate for council just so we kind of know at least get a good understanding of where a lot of the budget expenses are coming from so we have the fire funding um, that's about 1.2 million um, and that hasn't changed uh, until there's uh, future information on that topic um, the curb funding that's a community enhancement uh, recreation board so what that is is it's 0.1 of a mill of all classes and I believe back in 2012, there was a resolution by uh, council that said of, of that 0.1 mil, 50,000, a maximum of 50,000 would be donated to libraries in the service area. So that's the libraries in the county and also the uh, areas that the residents use. We have CRISP funding, which is, we've budgeted for about uh, 550,000. So we have an agreement in signed with most of the villages and um, service regions around so that agreement goes until 2020. Uh, we have a fuel expense for public works so that's gas and diesel. Um, it, it's a big expense for the, the county. We have quite a bit of surface area to cover. So based on our estimations we have about 1.5 million liters of diesel and about 400,000 of gasoline. Illegal. Uh, we just find ourselves sometimes in situations where We'll ask legal opinion. It's very important to, to save ourselves from financial liability and liability here at the county. So we've kind of increased that expense a little bit. Insurance, um, the, the premiums increase, we kind of go with um, the premiums increase. We have more equipment kind of coming on board, so that expense increases a little bit. Uh, the utility expense, it's down a little bit. There's kind of a couple factors. We just over budgeted in the previous year, so we're kind of bringing it back to a normal. Um, what, where it should be, and we do we do lock in rates with uh, our service provider for future years. So we have someone kind of working on that for us. So we've kind of secured lower rates. 
and donations to others. So there's donations to others. We have uh, we have commitments to uh, the Strathmore Fieldhouse, the the Golden Hills School Division Gymnasium projects, Stars Ambulance, and a couple other miscellaneous administration administrative donations, which includes the Strathmore Handy Bus. Transfers to and from reserves. So those are just kind of regular reserves. We we take money in and then we'll transfer them to, for a future use. Uh, the transfer from is for the fire funding, and then the transfers to go to a bunch of just various different reserves. So those reserves are a fire capital, uh, equipment, paved on paid road reserves. So there's just kind of a, a, a few different areas that we kind of put that to. So just based on those quick areas that I touched on in the operating budget that's just over 75 percent of the operating budget so they're kind of big ticket items that we we do pay for and that's kind of where the bulk of the money goes um one thing i'm going to mention as well is that our amortization i've kind of uh maybe touched on this briefly before but amortization it's a non-cash expense so money doesn't actually flow out of our pocket for this but it's kind of it's an accounting estimate used for uh the service life or the life of an asset. So a building would be amortized every year, equipment would be amortized every year, a water plant would be amortized every year. And we have a, a policy, uh, I believe it's 3.2, 3 it's our TCA policy. And so we have set those, or council has set those policies for those rates based on best information and we amortize our assets accordingly. So throughout the budget package, that blue line will be there. And that's just to illustrate to council that that's a non-cash expense in that very specific um, item or department, sorry. So another item I just wanted to kind of touch on with council is just kind of the breakdown of the county's revenue. So taxation accounts for about 88.5% of the county revenue or about 40, just under 43 million. Um, there's user fees and recoveries and that's anywhere from uh, utility charges, various miscellaneous recoveries that occur during the fiscal year, such as like a bill back to a village uh, for like a service that we provide. Um, this transfers, my apologies, it should say transfers from reserves. Um, and that's, the, that's again the fire funding kind of coming in here again. So that's what that line item is. I'll fix that for the next one. Uh, pen penalties and interest. So the penalties being penalties on uh, property tax, so we charge 5% if it's uh, past June 30th. And the interest is kind of the bulk of that, and that's interest on our reserve. So we, we've kind of budgeted that we'll see, receive about $1 million in 2019. So that's up from previous years, and the reason because of that is rising interest rates. Uh, we've also got operating grants. So those operating grants, those consist of our provincial MSI operating grants. So that's about 130,000. We receive grants for ASB, um, and those are about 260,000, kind of give or take. Um, and then we've got other grants, such as smaller employee grants for summer wages, um, that could be maybe around 50 or 40,000, kind of thing. Just various step ones in the Canada summer jobs. And some, we'll, we will receive disaster recovery grants sometimes too, and that's kind of all flow through the operating. And then there's kind of other pieces here too, such as like the long-term debt, the capital levy revenue, fines and rentals. Um, th those are smaller pieces, definitely important. We always include them, so. Um, under note one, I just wanted to kind of break out to council kind of our uh, taxation revenue, the amounts and what it kind of makes up of that big piece. So 59% is the non-residential. That's kind of our, our biggest one. Uh, residential is about six or 17%, sorry. It says 18 here, but just uh, rounding. Uh, machinery equipment's about 16% and uh, farmland's at seven. So one item that doesn't really show up on the graph here, and I kind of took it out, is uh, federal lieu, or grant in lieu of taxes. So that's federal and provincial buildings. They don't pay taxes, but they pay a grant in lieu of taxes, so. Um, kind of one other item I was just gonna touch on. Sometimes some departments will look a little bit off, um, but sometimes it's just because there is no other kind of spot to put those expenses. So one item I was gonna kind of just point out is the administration uh, budget tab expense. 
So we take a look at this administration expense for 2019. And the final cost of the administration budget is 17.6 million. And we're thinking, okay, that's quite a bit. But there's kind of items that we kind of just kind of have to lump into that very specific area that, you know, we could put in areas, but just historically it's been under the administration tab. So kind of the, the items I'd like to just point out in there are the education levies in there. So that's $10.6 million. Um, we, we could put that at the top. It's just, just kind of where it falls for us. We've kind of been consistent that way. Uh, the CRISP funding is about 550000 So that also falls under the administration tab. Uh, the Wheatland Housing Requisition, that's 286000 Transfers to reserves also always go into the, um, whoops, also always go into the, the tabs because it is an expense. It's kind of the way we balance the budget. Uh, so that's 1.3 million. Um, the IDP ICF costs, those are also kind of administration. That's, a, as we all know, it's kind of just a government mandated program that we're kind of falling into to get uh, in agreement with our neighbors. And then there's always, there can be some allowances sometimes. In administration, we have a taxation allowance of 200,000. Uh, it's right here. And that's just a, it's a best estimate. Um, sometimes if an assessment value is appealed, we'll kind of go through a process. Sometimes it can lead to uh, a hearing that will have board members and just kind of various things that if the rate period doesn't agree with their assessed value. And then the amortization, it's always included as well. So that's 341,000 in this tab. So if you kind of take out all of those expenses, and the administration one is the best example because there is a significant portion of kind of a default expenses that fall into there. So if you take all those out, it kind of falls around 3.5 million. I believe that's all I kind of had pre prepared for the operating budget. Is there any questions? Any direction? Yeah, I've got questions um, just because I don't know a lot. Um, but just on the general ed ledger taxation um, line, one oh 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 eleven twelve there um, and the one right below it. I'm just curious um, the well that one line commercial levy revenue. I mean it's a good thing, but uh, it's went up su substantially. We budgeted for seven hundred and sixty thousand, and we're pulling in five point five million, and that's over the last two years. It's really went up. So I was just curious why. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question. So in 2017, we went through a, um, a system software change. So with that, we kind of, we had different kind of classes coded to different things. So when we're kind of looking at the taxation revenue, um, both of those fall into non-residential. So whether it be commercial or industrial, the kind of, we take both totals um, of these two together. So like this budget amount and this budget amount um, so yeah, you kind of combine them together. Um, yeah, and one other kind of piece I'd maybe provide, or suggestion I'd provide to council, if you're ever looking at a taxation comparison, what I would kind of do is I'd kind of take the, the year-to-date total or the budget year-to-date total, and sometimes those can swing. Um, sometimes we budget a certain amount, and then we'll send out our assessment notices, and sometimes uh, an owner of a property could um, appeal that assessment and their assessment may go down which would result in the kind of the taxation the, the, the budget not kind of lining up with the year to date so Thank you. okay I, <clears throat> I need some I need some uh, I'm, I'm missing something here I think um, I went back to the very first as far as I know first draft operating budget of November uh, 7th, 2017. So under operating revenue line 42 or uh, 42 dash, sorry, it's small, uh, the 41s and the 42s, which are the water and wastewater. And, and then I look at this new one and what am I missing in Gleeson? We went from, we went from, um, 
Water in Glacian was going to be estimated in 2019 at $402,000. And we are now going to spend $713,000. Now, is there some, is something being depreciated? Because that's 300 and some odd thousand dollars increase in water for Glacian. And I, I don't know, because it, and it's continuous, it's not a one off. It, it's, it's up 3%, whatever, the following years. So I like, because I got nothing better to do. I did the, so from from what we were given a, basically a year ago as an operating budget to now as our operating budget, the price of water to all our communities has gone up $403,000. And our sewer has gone down $3,200. I think some of it's got to do with WRC, but I just don't know what, how you can increase the water. We're spending $700,000 on water in Gleeson and we get $150,000 back. I mean, we had to go big or go home or something. I, I just don't understand how that can go up that high. And I don't think, um, unless like there's a piece of equipment in there that I'm, I'm totally unaware. Um, through the chair, so are we looking at the the actual costs for 2016-17, or are we looking at the... the okay, so I, I, what I did was I took, I'll say, if you take um, from the November 7th um, draft operating budget, if you take line 4203 and project it into 2019, or sorry, um, I'm 41, I'll, I apologize, 4103, and projected into uh, 2019, it was $402,000. And if I take the unapproved operating budget now for 2019, same line, it's $713,309. That's a $311,000 increase, and I just don't know why that should be. Um, through the chair, I think kind of the best I'm not sure if that would be the best document to kind of compare it to. So what you're kind of comparing the unapproved 2019 budget to is um, the November 7th unapproved draft copy, right? Um, is there a way that maybe we could take that information back and compare it to the approved 2018 budget? Would that work better or? Well, all, all I'm doing is I just got these, you know, like the, this is all, we're sort of doing the, I. I and this could be ignorance on my behalf. Just that, um, no, and November 7th, when I got this, I got this copy of the book, these were the numbers. And now a year later, these numbers are, and they're the same lines and everything else. And they're just, they're like, totally different, like they're not totally different. Like most of them are, most of them are, the rest of them are sort of in the ballpark. But Gleeson isn't like, so I'm just trying to figure out what what I'm thinking. What what am I looking at that is wrong? So, through the chair, if I could just uh, attempt to to answer some of those questions, um, as far as the November seventh uh, <clears throat> proposed interim budget, that was um, not including. Um, there was a number of items that were still in the works as far as a uh, land. Um, as far as a manpower sharing agreement, that sort of thing. So that initial budget was based on previous numbers of salaries um, from current county employees, that sort of thing. Um, what the what the revised um, 2018 approved budget showed at is, and I have a breakdown here of, of what the actual costs are for Gleeson. So we have um, a cost of 200 Two hundred five thousand dollars for Gleeson water. That's included in that budget number there. That's the actual cost of water that's billed to us from WRC uh, at three forty a, a cubic meter. Uh, we also have a monthly flat rate of ten thousand four hundred dollars a month, um, so one hundred twenty-five thousand a year. That's also included in that uh, WRC operating contingent there. Um, and then the final number that's included in that is the portion of Gleeson's labor, which is billed to us from WRC 
uh, for the operation of that system. And then it ends up being, um, I don't have 2018 numbers here broken down, but it's around $60,000 for labor on that. So we've, we've taken those numbers that were approved in the, in the March 31st, April 2018 budget and just increased them as per the, uh, we, we looked at the numbers and I, like I said, we were gonna go through and, and do a breakdown and see where we're at with, with manpower. Um, so we've done that as close as we can with August numbers here and projected what we would spend for the rest of the, the 2018 year. And then that's what you see in the, the number for the WRC contracted services uh, for Gleeson. So correct, it, it has changed quite significantly since the November draft, but that's because those interim agreements were not yet in place. Um, so we were looking at old, the, uh, what it was included in that number was not any cost of new water from Gleeson or uh, WRC manpower. It was county salary staff and basically utilizing the old plant in that initial draft. So I think even the December 3rd one has more up-to-date numbers on that one. But are we actually spending 700 and some odd thousand dollars a year for water in Gleeson? No. Um, so you'll see in that number there as well, that includes the amortization that, um, that Brian was talking about for 120,000. You can't really see it because it's in blue there. 120,500. And so I'll correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, that, is, that 700,000 includes that. Um, I still I, I'm pretty sure that when the county signed up for WRC we didn't say we're gonna I mean is are the other municipalities having similar like are Rockyport and, and Standard having similar increases on that line? I mean, that, that, that's substantial, right? Mm -hmm. Like you would assume that you're going to do something and it's either going to be sort of cost neutral or you'd prefer that it would cost you less money, but if, if it's not going to cost you way more money else, I mean, at this kind of money, we would have been way better off putting our own water treatment in and paying for the thing without government grants. It would have been paid in 10 years, my opinion. Yeah. Okay, if I can. So that's, that's the increase. Last, our year for Galician is 337, almost $338,000. There's been no talk about increasing it at all. That's the hard numbers from what I got from uh, WRC. We haven't talked any budget yet at, uh, at WRC. We're still trying to get a handle on what was actually spent this year because it's our, it's our first year. I, I might be looking at this. I just, Plus, don't, I just don't understand this because it's, it's in a line item yeah. and it's substantially, like you look at all those other, you look at all those other, you look at, you look at Carsland, you look at, at, at um, Speargrass, you look at Rosebud, and they're sort of in that area, they're more money, but they're not that much more money. So I just, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I uh, so, so through the chair, I, it, it really does come down to, there is a very new, very expensive plant in Gleeson that isn't in any of the other communities. Gleeson required a new, water treatment plant, whether it be a standalone, whether it be a, a regional plant, um, that had to be paid for somehow. And the decision was made to go with the regional system. So if we, I, and we looked at this, you're right, we would have had some of the grant funding done through um, the AMWIP grant and 75% and potentially paid of a standalone plant if we went to there. But these numbers are real, they're in front of us. If we were to, have constructed a standalone plant with uh, reserve money, 
You're right. We probably would have debentured back some portion of it to county ratepayers, and then the rest would have been absorbed by the, the reserves, technically, or likely. So this is a lot more visible of a number when you bring it in this context here. Um, but I don't think that the, the actual end result is that much different if you look at the comparison. Okay, so then does that mean Rockyford's plant was on the last leg? So did they have this kind of increase? And Standard's plant was, was, was on its last legs. So did they have this? Like, this is, this is huge number. Like, I can't imagine a municipality. Like, if, if Gleeson was a hamlet or was, a, was still a town, they'd be done. You wouldn't, I mean, you can't, you can't run this like this. I just don't, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. Something's off here. I'm sorry. Sorry, just another question because once again, I, I don't know. Um, so forgive me for my naiveness. Um, 3201, 2531, the road maintenance, uh, page 410 in the agenda. I'm just curious, we've been uh, over budget the last two years and currently are this year. By 150,000, and yet we still only budget for 100,000 next year. Just curious. Uh, yes. So part of that does get transferred over to capital. So when when we receive the invoice, um, we'll we'll take that number and we'll just kind of put it into operating. And then at points we take that amount and transfer it over to capital. And you could see that in kind of in other various places. One good place yeah. would be. Office, office expenditures, so we kind of have a, a line dedicated to that for capital, and sometimes it just get, gets put into the wrong account, then we'll move it over. The only number that is way off is the Gleeson water one. I mean, the other ones we're paying way more money for. We're paying more money for, but I don't have, because I don't have the right, I can't compare apples to apples, but I know that I wouldn't have got it, we wouldn't have got the draft operating budget without it being in the ballpark of what, what has gone before it. They wouldn't have made up new numbers. Well, I just went off of the... I just went off the November 7th, 2017. That's the only, that's the first book I've got from, that was the first day, we, first council session we had. And I was overwhelmed. So then I went over it and I just, I, and it just seemed, it just seemed high and it's like, it is like, I don't know why water, it costs us that much water, money to supply water in Galician, because it wasn't before. I mean, they were talking $400,000, which, is still a money losing operation, but now we're talking seven hundred thousand dollars, and I don't know. Like maybe it's like if we amortize, if we're trying to get rid of stuff, I don't know. I'm not like I'm just asking the question. It just I'd like to see you know, where the seven hundred thousand is. Where do you see it? It's on line forty uh, on the September eighteenth. It's on uh, 4201, That's uh, page three eighty three, I think. Is it in this package here we got today? Yeah. Yes, it is. And it's on the it's on operating the interim operating so sewer and water cleaning sewer and water so it's it's the uh, forty one and the forty two hundreds. And then if you take the amortization off, it's five ninety two seven fifty four. Not I'm not seeing it yet. What page is it? Uh, on the, My apologies. Uh, on the agenda package, it's page uh, two forty eight. 
and in the operating budgets, page 48 of the hard copy. It's just uh, maybe five numbers below the page 48 in here. Yeah. Where's the 700,000 in police on this page? Total expenditures? This whole page is Total expenditures yeah. for 2019, and then that's, there's the amortization. So just. Yeah, the whole page is Gleason. Contracted services this year that I'm aware of is three hundred thirty seven thousand. There's also another charge that the county pays at two hundred and uh, 27,000, but that's for labor for for all the And I'm thinking that 337,000 is going to go down next year uh, Through the, the labor charges that were your no of, the, the Galician water consumption one I'm thinking is going to go down. It's a potential. We, we hope that with the the uh, increased water conservation and that sort of thing, and the, and truthfully, the the cost of water usually drives down the the usage of it. Um, we haven't seen that this year, though. With them, well, so I get my way. That three hundred thirty-seven thousand consumed eighty-two. 62,000 cubic meters and was charging five dollars 41 cents a cubic meter and the price of water is probably around four dollars I'm guessing we haven't got a price on it yet this price is not accurate at all it had to do with them contracts that were out and this is a bad number but Having said that, that, come October, we're going to hopefully have a price for water. That's all we're buying is water. We're not buying anything else. Right? From the, from the county, you're saying? Or from, or from the, the, we, or from the sorry, We're WMC? only buying water for Galician. Um, so uh, part of the, uh, we're purchasing water through the chair, we're purchasing water, and there is also a monthly flat rate. Yeah, contributed as well to that. Yeah, the monthly flat fee. Yeah, yeah, they broke it down again to the three forty for is all we're paying for water. If you pay one hundred twenty-five thousand, there you go. Yeah, so five forty. It's still five forty-one a cubic meter, and uh, my little bit of fingering, I got it down to four dollars a cube, dollar less, and I'm including things that maybe shouldn't even be in there. Mm -hmm. That's a talk we have to do at that board level. Uh, 
standard. I can look standard up for you here. Standard pays five thirty nine for a cubic meter of water. But that gets them covered for their wastewater and for their distribution and their billing. That pays for all that. They're within five thousand dollars of having that covered with that five thirty nine. And Rocky Ford pays the same. And they were in the hole by, I don't know how much, I'll tell you here. But these are just rough numbers, so yeah. It's rough, or standard was within 5,000. Rocky Ford is $38,000 in the hole, and Wheatland County was. $87,000 too much. I caution you, those oh, numbers yeah, are, the whole salary that are uh, inaccurate the numbers. I Because I got no yeah, better numbers until October. We'll have more, we'll have definite numbers, I'm hoping, for, for the year's operation. But to, to get the definite numbers, it's hard to. Because at the beginning of the year, we didn't have any numbers. It was just. No, I guess more or less. Yeah. Corporation yeah. itself has money in the bank. So yeah, it's it's a hard call. I can't answer any more than that. But why they're different True. in here, I don't know either. And some of this that would be in here would be our our distribution. Yeah. Our clear well and our distribution, our pumps and and the chemical that goes in the clear wells, which is not covered with WRC. Clear well. So our water, our rate is just dumps it into the clear well. Then from the clear well, we have to maintain chemical and pump it out to the everybody, right? I don't know what that costs. So let, let us uh, go back and take another look at, so there's some work that's planned to be done in 2019, because as you can see, contracted services water, there's $51,000 there. So maybe if we explain to you what that is, the contract we have with w WRC, we'll just reconfirm that that's the right number in there, but I mean, we're tied into a contract unless that changes, depending on what WRC comes back for with a budget. Yeah. Um, the other one on there, I think, is insurance. So we'll just take a look at the insurance just to make sure now that we don't have a fully operating plant, maybe that insurance goes down because I think WRC is insuring that water line. Um, the other one is supplies, Galician water. When you look at the last couple of years, we haven't expended the, the amount of the uh, budget. So maybe we can take a look at that. Utilities, electrical, water, Gleeson. Um, again, I'm not sure about why that one is the same. Maybe that should be a little bit lower. So there's some areas there that we can certainly look at and tidy that up in this particular one. So we'll just, what, I, what I've kind of asked Mike to do is get more detail on that and then he can bring it back because there's cleaning of the, uh, the reservoir and things like that that are in there. So we need to explain to you how much that costs to do that. You don't do it necessarily every year. We've been trying to do it, what, every two to three years, Mike? Three years. Three years. So that might be up in 2019. But this doesn't explain that. So we'll have to bring that information back. I guess now is as good a time as I need to ask as well. So we're, and I've admitted this before, I'm really ignorant about water and wastewater. So the way that the water comes to us, is that the same as in Rocky Board and Standard? Like, are they getting it to their clear well and then? Delivered to their clear wells, but the prices that were charged this past year are not the same. That has, is being talked about in October. Okay. When we get the definite numbers. It wasn't done. On purpose, I think we were. It's just the way the contracts worked out. I'm thinking the contracts will be definitely changing. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, WRC is mandated by policy to charge the same for everybody. Every, there's no difference. Standard is the well, their clear well is right there. Rocky Ford and Gleeson has to be pumped to it. Standard is contributing to that. So everybody pays the same. That's That was a principle we have. It's easy to say it's harder to get it done in the first year. Just an unrelated question, and you've probably explained this before too. Why does the fire um, like come out of reserve, whereas the rest of the budget doesn't? Uh, yes. Yeah, so through the chair, that's just kind of how it was set up historically. So what we do is we we transfer a certain amount in. So what we do is we take, I think it's point two of all assessment classes, and we transfer it in. And then there's certain parts of that that don't come out until a capital item comes out. So a good example would be a fire hall in a hamlet. So they, they don't use that money every year or they don't get equipment every year. So we transfer more in. And I believe there's, I'd have to take a look at the funding, the exact model and get back to you. But um, like I think it's point one of a certain class goes to buildings, point one goes to like larger equipment. But that money doesn't come out. So it kind of all... Yeah, and it all gets kind of transferred in, then transferred out w when it needs it. Oh, we certainly don't. Um, we can do it anyway. Um, the funding model sticks until there's like a change. But um, yeah, that's just kind of the way the accounting has, I guess, showed it. I'm not sure when, before my time anyways. So I've kind of just didn't touch it and kind of left it the same. It, 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 it works, but it's just kind of different ways you can do it. We can show it as uh, straightly the, a mill rate off the, off the top for non-res and res and how that's laid out. That's not a problem to do that and not put it into reserve and take it back out. Um, is the debenture in Carsland paid off? I see it's budgeted, but there's nothing being taken out for it. Uh, yes, so through the chair, um, just the way the, the kind of the, the municipal budget works, we have to show the, the cash flow kind of coming out um, in the actual budget. So cash flows in equals cash flows out. So we do pay that amount, and it does come down every year. I believe the Cars Land one is, I believe it's a 20... 30 somewhere around there like that's when that debenture is completely paid um, so actually a good example would be the Galician um, water Galician so there's a debenture in that hamlet that's actually coming expired in, at the end of 2020 so this number will just need to be updated from the um, donation from the estate of Justice Charlotte Prouse so that the 2020 number will come down but it's kind of money in must equal money out less the amortization that's kind of how that budget's balanced so instead of the two account being expensed, it's a, it's a liability account, which is a four. So our debt comes down, or liability comes down, sorry. So going with WRC, it looks like Carsland and Speercross did a lot better. That they're actually um, cost recovery. Close, right? If I read this right. I could be not. Am I right in assuming that? Oh. Yeah. Um, as said, this, these through the chair, these are our projections uh, taken from end of August numbers here. So we can anticipate that looking at our trending here, we are going to be uh, a lower manpower rate for. The other communities in, in in the three hamlets that remaining had Clooney, um, Rosebud, and Carlisle and Speargrass. Um, we will be we're anticipating lower manpower costs for that. Yeah. That's right. And and like I say, the the main 
cost of any treatment is the salary. So the fact that we're reducing that significantly through these manpower sharing agreements, um, that you'll see the end result of lower costs for the entire system. Mike, I have another question. If there was um, something in the Hamlet that um, was requested and um, they said, well, it wasn't in this year's budget, how do we get it to next year's budget or budget? I'll just talk to you or like there was that uh, correction in the back alley there. Um, the resident was told that it wasn't in the budget for this year. And so I thought, well, I better make sure it's in next year. But it's quite a minor thing. Do you guys kind of do a, a larger number and then kind of work off that, right? You don't have to, you don't have, to have specifics for every area that you work on in the Hamlets. Yeah, so through the chair, there is... Uh I believe it's about 5,000 for capital improvements. Uh, yeah, so we, yeah. we have a threshold that has a limit on capital items. So the threshold for kind of capitalization for us uh, is 5,000. Um, the reason why we set that limit is so that s smaller repairs aren't always capitalized. It's just quite a bit more work that may not reflect um, the, tr the true assets of the county. So it, it, I don't know much about this expense that you're kind of mentioning. I don't know the cost or the severity of it. Um, if there is an item, then we certainly do welcome council direction. And that this is the point where we kind of bring those items up and then we can include them in the 2019 budget. And I don't know the cost either. Yeah, so through the chair, uh, this is a, an item I think I'm aware of. It's a, a concrete square we're looking at for, yeah. for Cars Land. It's around a ballpark $40,000. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite expensive. It's quite expensive. So <laughs> so that's why we had not moved. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we, we have put one in, in Carsland at, at McKinnon prior, and that's where I got that number from previously. So we can reassess this one, uh, but I, I knew right away it wasn't going to fit in the 2018 budget. So we looked at, um, and we are doing other uh, methods right now. Uh, we've done some other um, techniques to that, that ditch to hopefully improve the flow, because I, I still don't think that that is going to be the end result. It's going gonna, it's gonna to fix our problem there. What's that, sorry? Do you think that 40000 is going to be necessary? Well, no. That's what I'm saying. I, 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 that's why you don't see it in this capital budget that we're going to look at right away, because I don't think that is an appropriate fix for that area for a small drainage issue. So, yeah, that's we can discuss it more at the, at the capital budget. I guess, Donna, when you want something in the budget, just uh, during a council meeting, make a motion or it gets staff to do an RFD and then if it's approved motion then it goes into the budget that would be the for your perspective when you want something done make a motion yeah mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> well so go Brian's going to kind of explain to you kind of roughly what the cost recovery is in cars line I think it's getting close to 75 80 percent so uh, yes yeah, so through the chair so if we're kind of looking at cost recovery kind of the the method we'd have to kind of take a look at is we would want to take out regular expenses from this whole thing um, and amortization out of it as well so are you looking for this yeah so if we're looking at cars lines um, budgeted revenue so in 2019, we have budgeted about 146,000. Um, so then that's how much money is coming in. And that's for, uh, there's the debenture fee that's levied on every uh, account there. The sale of water is the bulk of it. Um, so we're sitting at about 146,000. So when you come down to Cars Land, you see there's about 300, oops, 307,000 of expenses. So what you would do is you would take out the non-cash expense item, which is the amortization. So that's about 95000 So take 307 minus 95, 
probably sitting at about 215. So 146 divided by 215, roughly about um, 75%. So that's kind of, if you're looking at cost recovery, those are kind of the items you'd be looking for. Um, yeah. Just so you, just a little bit more to that, that's mainly operating costs. So the minute we do an underground water line or sewer line, that throw, screws that out, out. Most times at this point we get MSI funding or federal gas tax funding that goes towards that. So that's grant funding that we use towards that. So as an example, the debenture fee in Carsland, that's probably for a past water replacement, I think. Yeah, so that would be for, I don't know the very specific item, but the kind of the theory behind it is that would be infrastructure that's already put, put in place and kind of debentured against the hamlet. So here, what you can see is the uh, 20, 25,300. Um, and down here, the kind of that cash in versus out. So the cash in against the debenture is 25,300. And then there's some interest costs on that one as well. So you need to take that on both sides because essentially it's a it's a wash, right? Yeah. yeah, so that one specifically, kind of that point of cash in versus cash out, we have to show it in, in the municipal budget for MGA purposes that the cash is coming in and it's going out against that very same kind of item. And that's I think the only one that doesn't have that is Gleeson because Gleeson is not our asset, correct? Um, so Gleeson still has one and it, it's almost paid off. But um, that's for past, that's for water yeah past but I'm talking about for the pipeline from standard oh it's not our assets so it's oh. not amortized or there's no de debenture in regards to that yeah so there is no debenture with that that specific item because we don't own that asset it's not the county's asset uh, in that very well could be um, I'd have to take a look I'm not 100% positive what repair that went to um, uh, through the chair if I recall correctly it is for the lagoon construction that we did uh, about four years ago uh, we expanded or deepened that lagoon so that went to benefiting both cars line and speargrass so I, I do, yeah I do believe there's a an adventure for that in speargrass So, so further to, the, to that, Mr. Chairman, maybe what we can do is uh, we'll revisit some of the numbers in Gleeson and double check the numbers for the water in Carsland and uh, Speargrass and what have you. And what we'll do is we'll uh, come up with, based on the budget, kind of an estimated uh, cost recovery for those, for operating the water, not for the replacement. Because there's no way to know that exactly what we're going to need to replace and what the costs are going to be at this point. But, um, so just to operate the water and then you'll have a bit better idea so we know it's around that 70 75 percent mark in uh, cars land and we'll do spear grass and bros bud and uh, Gleeson as well I think after we kind of revisit those numbers and we'll bring back a little bit more information as to what capital or what operating projects are going to be done out of that 51,000 uh, 15,000 like I say we'll revisit the insurance just to make sure that we're covered off there and we're not overestimating on that so do we operate the spare grass water we are WRC operate spare grass water uh, so through the chair the WRC operates all the water and wastewater facilities in the county in the county so under spare grass there's nothing in the WRC we, we this year we did take the the water for spear grass and place it into the cars land just to because they're the same system we didn't want to have the crossover there when really it's the same That's operations so you'll see that the 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 cost we have a breakdown of basically 40 percent of our labor goes into cars land water and wastewater uh 35 percent in degletion and then 25 percent into rosebud Clooney is such a low we, we don't have a, an existing water system, they're only wastewater, so we have very limited um, mm -hmm. 
manpower required there. So again, there's another one that we'll double check the numbers. We've got $75,000 budgeted for supplies, speargrass. And when you look at 2017 for the full year, we only spent 24, 32 and 2016. So we just want to make sure uh, maybe we're doing the clear well, you know, what have you. So we'll just double check that number and make sure. And we'll look at the other numbers as well. The uh, electrical seems like that would be okay because our rates came down. So we'll just double check the other numbers on all those water utilities for sure and wastewater. So when I'm looking here, contracted services in Galician and in Speargrass, it's got the same general ledger number. The Galician one is like uh, 187,000 year to date. And the other one for Speargrass is 35,000. So I'm thinking that it's a huge discrepancy. I don't know what the, what the contracted service is. That's strictly the labor contract? Or is that some water in there too? Yeah, well, it's sure. nothing separated out then. It's not. We put in the same line item here. Um, I think we could probably break it out if, if council feels they want to see the cost of water separated from the labor cost on that. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think that's probably fairly simple. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very simple. We receive invoices that have both labor and water charges on them, so we can certainly break those out. It won't take very much. We can do it probably even, well, we can certainly do it before the second. So it makes it hard for me to look at my WRC and compare it to this one when, when they're the same numbers, but they're in different columns. So in October, so council knows, staff was going to try and break down the pure cost of water plus how many hours they spend in each water treatment plant in Carsland and yeah so that would be useful information for for us right you can uh, they have a capability I think every half hour on their timesheets they can uh, and then the mileage that's the easy part, but the, the actual hours of labor spent in each plant is. Just a question uh, comes to my mind, and I, you probably told me, Brian, but where do we attribute the revenue or, or the invoicing that we send to WRC for the labor component? Does that come back into here, or does that go somewhere else? That one specifically goes into water general. Um, so that's another thing you're not yeah. seeing there. So what we do is because we have one contracted employee that contracts the WRC, until that changes, we invoice them, they invoice us back for only the portion that's used in that system. We use that person in our systems mm -hmm. outside of that, correct, Mike? Yeah, so probably 80% of the time is in WRC or maybe a little bit more right now, and then the rest of the time is spent on Wheatland County stuff. So, so that might be another thing that we need to do is break that out. questions Scott while we're talking about labor there I know Mike and I talked about this before some clarity as to what the Hamlet crews are doing versus what WRC is doing because I'd asked you before are they directing our staff or are they doing 
how would I put it, the infrastructure work within the hamlets and the lagoons and things like that. I just, I'm just curious to who's doing what because I was told one thing and now I'm being told something different, so I'm not too sure. You don't have to answer that now. Yeah, yeah. Because it's just when I'm looking at this, thinking, okay, the labor's all covered by this, and then I hear it's not. I'm not sure what way to think. And same with what we were just talking about, the 70 30. It makes it too com complicated. It needs to be just done, in my opinion. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's, you don't want to get frustrated, but you need to know what you're looking at. Any other questions? Go ahead, Brian. You got anything you want to add? Or? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, not, nothing on the operating piece anyway, so... Um, maybe we can move over to the capital one if that's okay. Sure. Um, so one thing I'm just going to mention about the capital one is that we're still kind of firming up the, the projects that we are going to work on in 2019 and in future years. We have a vague idea, but we just want to make sure that we do have um, kind of a firmer idea. I know that Mike has been working with the, the road plan with you guys as well, so that we'll kind of uh, put that together. So I'm just going to say something about that because I know it's been mentioned. It's been a concern for Brian and myself for some time. So we're trying to work on a uh, solution. I think we've got a solution, perhaps, with the capital project. So what happens with the road construction projects? We budget for 10 miles. We end up, depending on whether you get an eight or nine done, and then we add another six, and then we got 14. So we don't always expend what we're going to do. <coughs> so I think, do you want to kind of explain what we talked about and how that was, how that'll kind of show up in the budget when we show the projects you want to, do you want to do that Brian are you you okay with doing it yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we're kind of proposing to council as Alan mentioned we've kind of had a problem in the past where we'll say that we're going to do a, a lot of projects <coughs> but kind of a problem that we run into is the the constraint of time so we say we're going to do 14 miles of road but we'll only do eight so we kind of ended up doing kind of half of what we do so we have a good idea of what our costs will be. So our costs will be our employees, our, the benefits that we pay them, a charge out of the equipment that they use and materials that are used on the roads that are being created. Um, so what we kind of are suggesting is sometimes those projects don't go under or aren't undertaken due to some restrictions such as environmental restrictions or landowners not um, uh, maybe the projects held up for just for various other reasons. So kind of what we're proposing to do is to make our capital budget more accurate is that we list off um, projects that we have to do. So say there's projects, one is the top priority, two is the top, second, and three is the third. So what we'll do is we'll attempt to do number one, but if we're held up on that one, we'll move to number two. So what this will kind of do is we'll give council and staff a better um, accurate cost of what will be completed in that fiscal year. So that's kind of one thing we're kind of proposing to do. In the past, what's happened is the engineer is coming up with a budget. Mm -hmm. and so, so much a mile, let's say, for real simplifying it, a million dollars a mile. So if we're going to do 14, that's $14 million. We end up only doing 9 million or 9 miles, so that's 9 million. So that's why we got the 5 million. So what we want to do is we're going to say we're going to do 9 million or 9 miles. That's going to be 9 million, let's say. Um, but we don't know exactly which nine miles it's going to be because of environmental regulation we're holding up, held up because there's cattails along the road or, or whatever, right? Or mm -hmm. uh, the land, like Brian said, like we've had itch, concerns or issues with landowners wanting uh, a little more consultation and those things. So some, maybe we may, may not get it done that year. The other option that council's exercised in the last three or four years is we've contracted some of the work out. So um, our crews can only do a certain amount of work. And typically it's around that eight or nine miles depending on yeah depending on that so 
the only way we would expand that is if we expanded our crews, which I don't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend the council this time. I think we'd best just go out to the market and, and those are projects that need to be done this year. If they need to be done in 2019, we go to tender on those and get those tendered. Now we had a situation this year where we tendered one project and it came in way over budget. So then uh, we decided, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, we decided that our crews are going to do that project because we felt that we could do it and get it done. So correct? Yeah, so that just puts us back behind on those other nine miles that we lined up for our crews. Now all of a sudden they're only going to be able to do six of those or five of those because there's four miles on this other project that was contracted. So it's kind of complex. So we're trying to bundle it, I guess, is for lack of a better word. Trying to, it's not the best way to do it, but I think it's one of the only ways we can do it because we need to budget accurately on the projects. But when we don't know exactly which projects are going to happen year to year, um, it makes it a little bit tougher. So. Go ahead, Amber. So if I understand correctly, it's kind of the concept of a project pool that we've talked about. So it gives you guys the liberty to go ahead and do the environmental work, the certifications, whatever, but it won't necessarily, and then you can prioritize based on all those factors as you're assessing them, because they change too as you're going through. So I think it makes a lot of sense to do So that pool, way. bundle, however yeah. you want to put it, that, that's kind of what we're thinking about. Um, and but I it think doesn't hold you up, so you have that liberty to go it, ahead. It doesn't hold if us up. We don't have to come back road. for approvals. We can start moving ahead. And what we would still do, I think, and uh, we've kind of talked about it, is we'd still design those projects in any given year. So in 2019, we'd still design them, but we can pull this design off the shelf, so to speak, and this one can get done this year. And next year, 2020, we maybe have to wait for that one because there's some kind of hold up there. So um, it gives us a little more flexibility if council is okay with that. So it's going to look a little bit, for lack of a better word, goofy in the budget, but I think we can probably explain it a little bit how we've done it, how we've laid it out, because we're going to bundle those projects when we show it in the budget, I believe, correct? That's kind of what we thought. Uh, yep. So kind of the rule that the council needs to follow is that council needs to authorize the expenditure of money. It's, I think, to Section 248 in the MGA. So authorizing the expenditure is that we've authorized the, the, the wages, the, the materials, and the, the charger rates on the equipment. So, so in the budget, so you're going to have 15 miles of road in the budget, if you possibly, if you can get it done, it'll all be in there. But it doesn't get done at the end of the year. You got 10 miles done, 10. You got four left over, so it's already been approved. <coughs> Do you just take that money and put it into reserves for next year, or how do you carry it forward? Because it's already been approved, so to say. Yeah, so kind of how it has been working is that the way we kind of do it is that we transfer in and then we transfer out what we spend. So we match that expenditure up with the reven capital revenue coming back in. So if it's not spent, we don't transfer it out. So if it's, the, the example is, say there's 15 miles of road at a million dollars or a million dollars a mile and say 10 get done, we wouldn't transfer out 15, we'd transfer out uh, 10. So that five would still just remain still in, in the reserve, yeah. So it's but, in the reserve to start with and you take it out as needed. Yeah. But, but we budgeted the 15 million to go into that reserve. Yeah. That's the, that's where that's the, the key. That's the key because then yeah. we're just putting more money into reserves and that just keeps getting uh -huh. slightly bigger every year, right? That's right. Which is not necessarily a bad problem to have, but there is other municipalities that aren't in that same position that look at Wheatland County because we have a fairly strong financial position, one of the strongest in the province, and other municipalities look at that and go, oh, you've got a lot of surplus money that we'd like to yeah. access, right? Yeah. Well, we're just optimistic. We think one year we're going to get all our work done. <laughs> And, and you'll see through the chair that in the presentation on Thursday, we did reduce a lot of our miles. Uh, what our expectations of our crew, a little more realistic yeah. expectations nowadays. We're down from the 14 we were a couple years back to 10, which is still um, a little high, but does leave the, the leniency to balance between projects if we come up against some obstacles. Mm -hmm. so. Good. Question on when you're road building, when do you run tilt? Like, I mean, like in the city, like in, on Stony, they run, they can run fairly uh, late, right? One year weather. Right, so it just year to year. Um, through the chair, we we do run 
the cruise as long as the weather allows us to. Um, we'll go until December. A few years back, we were working in December even. So, um, co No. Yeah, there you go. That's... Hopefully, it's this year. <laughs> I know it's the nice weather's coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One item, just like to illustrate to council as well, is that the capital is a five-year budget, and that's um, the, the county's historically done that, but that's an MGA requirement. Uh, the operating's three, and that's also an MGA requirement. Any question? So for the October uh, 2nd draft that's coming back, as Brian already indicated, there's no specifics in here. But now that uh, you folks went through on uh, the planning or the committee of the whole last Thursday, uh, Mike's got those numbers, going to put those numbers in. And for the October 2nd, we're going to have all that detail, more detail in there, still in a bundled kind of format for the road construction project. So, so it'll look more finished. So we're not looking for anything either than it. If we've missed any projects, uh, you'll know that on October 2nd because we'll, we'll bring that whole list back. So, um, so is there any like further council direction or wants or with the exception of the the water discussion we had earlier if there's any projects you're questioning or line items or any questions or directions we should provide any other questions comments wishes we have a WRC meeting tonight with that information, how many hours we spend on all them plants, how, is that useful information or is that more just for, would that be useful to you? Through the chair, that would be very useful. Uh, we do have every invoice we get from Darius, he does have the breakdown of hours in there as well, but if there's, we, we don't quantitate them into a, a specific file. So if, if, if WRC has more information, it's... Definitely that would be yep. I'll, I'll keep pushing for it then. Okay. So is there nothing else? No other wishes? What would council like us to do with the, would you like us to try to include that in the budget, that swale that you were oh, questioning? No. I don't believe it's currently in there, is it? No, much? and I, I just did a high level at that point. I knew that it was way over any kind of operational budget that we had, so. I went off of previous numbers. I can get a more detailed design number and, and see if it's something we want to look at. They um of course just kept putting gravel in. Well I think it's gotten a lot higher. So it all kind of goes into his uh backyard or kind of goes towards the rest of the housing. And uh, he just wanted, um, he just takes a shovel and uh, shovels it out into this ditch along, that, that eventually goes to a culvert. And he just wanted that dug out further and, and, and better. He'd be so shocked that it would cost $40,000. Well, that's putting in a concrete swale. That's, yeah. So concrete. I think he just wants a swale. 120 bucks a meter, uh, and I don't know how long it is, or whatever yeah. it is. I don't know what the concrete is. It's degrading, it's packing. It's degrading. So it's, maybe it's we can take a look project. at Taking just a grader out dig, there and just just dig the ditch out. Just profiling a little yeah. bit, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. We already did that actually. Heck of a deal. Anything else? 
I guess motion accept as information for now. All in favor? Aye. Carried. I think we're done. Not yet. Adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Carried. Thank you.